All right. This is the city council regular meeting um, at 6.30 p.m. Tuesday, April 6, 2021. I can't believe we're in April already. Um, uh, Mike, will you call the order? Mayor Karen Moran. Present. Deputy Mayor Christy Malchow. Present. Councilmember Ken Gamblin. Present. Councilmember Tom O'Dell. Looks like Tom's here. Uh, Councilmember Chris Ross. Present. Councilmember Pamela Stewart. Odell is here. Pam was here. She was on. I thought I saw Councilmember Stewart as well. She she was on there. I don't see her on the list of attendees currently. Yeah, she. Up, oh, I saw her uh, arriving. She, 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 oh, there she is. Yeah, it says web viewer. Councilmember Stewart. It's coming. It's slow, but here I am. Sorry, it just booted me out. Yep, she's here. Excellent. And uh, Councilmember Kent Treen. Present. Okay, I hope everybody enjoyed their couple of weeks off. We'll go right into meeting accessibility pursuant to the governor's emergency proclamation 20-25. The city is unable to provide an in-person location for the public to listen to the virtual city council meeting this evening. Meetings are still accessible to the public and public comment is able to be submitted. To view live, view the city website at www.sammamish.us forward slash TV21 at the city YouTube site or at Comcast channel 21 within Sammamish only. To view later, the meeting videos are available the day after the meeting, again on the city website at www.sammamish.us forward slash TV21, on YouTube or on Comcast channel 21 within Sammamish only. Uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, Councilmember Gamblin, could you lead us with that? Yes, yeah, certainly. All rise, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first thing up, we have the approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. I have a first and a second. Do I have any discussion? Here, hearing none. All those in favor of favor, <laughs> all those in favor of approval of the agenda, <laughs> say aye. 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 Opposed? Excellent. 7-0. Next we have um, the anti-Asian and racist violence resolution. And everybody should have a copy of that. And um, I would ask Tom O'Dell, would you like to read that for us? Okay. The resolution of the city of Sammamish, Washington, to act now on anti-Asian and racist violence. Whereas, since the very, very beginning of the COVID-19 pan pandemic, certain political rallies and press conferences have blamed the virus spread on people of Asian descent by repeatedly and purposefully calling COVID-19 the, quote, China virus, unquote, and or, quote, Kung flu, unquote, and, whereas since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, over 3,800 incidents of anti-Asian violence across all 50 states have been reported, including assaults on vulnerable elderly Asians, some of whom have resulted, some of which have resulted in the death or permanent maiming of those victims. And whereas violence, racial violence has sadly been weaponized against Asian persons 
throughout U.S. history, including the lynching of 18 Chinese immigrant laborers in Los Angeles in 1871, which was the largest mass lynching ever in America, and the expulsion of Chinese immigrant laborers during riots in Tacoma in 1855 and Seattle in 1886, and the internment of the Japanese Americans living on the Pacific West Coast in concentration camps during World War II, and whereas the recent increase in anti-Asian violence has again reached the Seattle area, according to data reported by the Seattle Police Department and the King County Prosecutor's Office, with nearly 400 reports of hate and bias incidents lodged in King County by the Chinese Information and Service Center since the spring of 2020, and whereas Asians are among the fastest growing racial groups in the U.S., with King County being nearly 20% Asian, and with some King County cities having an Asian demographic over 30%, and whereas both President Joseph Biden and Washington Governor Jay Inslee have issued statements condemning the spike in anti-Asian violence during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the City of Sammamish acknowledges during this May's Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month the many contributions of our Asian community and, to all, and also to firmly ensure that there is no place for hate crimes against any persons in the city of Sammamish or any other cities. And be it further resolved that we count on the Sammamish Police Department and the King County Sheriff's Office to track and respond to any reports of racial violence and to work with immigrant communities to ensure that their responses are culturally and linguistically sensitive and be it further resolved that we call on each school district within the city of Sammamish and King County to raise awareness regarding anti-Asian timing, to firmly discourage it, and to have resources available to address the resultant physical, mental, and emotional stress upon Asian youth, and be it resolved, further resolved that the city of Sammamish stands firmly in solidarity with the Asian community and all people of color against racial violence. And we acknowledge that anti-racism work must begin at the local level in our communities and our schools. Passed by the city council at a regular meeting thereof on the sixth day of April, 2021. Madam Mayor, that's the end. Thank you, council member. Next up, we have got. Did you want? Did you want to speak on that a little bit? I know you put a lot, of, awful lot of work into well, that. Well, um, racial hatred and violence of any kind is totally uncalled for in any society. Um, we are focusing on the uh, Asian American uh, and Pacific Islanders this evening. But I can make this a general statement for all racial groups within the United States and actually worldwide. Uh, there are any number of examples you could point at around the world today. Uh, I'm not going to get political, so I won't mention them all. Uh, but there are a whole ton of them going on today. All you have to do is pick up the newspaper and read what's going on internationally to know that uh, uh, this is not a problem that is unique to this country. Unfortunately, uh, we are facing it ourselves right here uh, in Washington State, in the Puget Sound area, and I suspect uh, even in Sammamish. Uh, so I think uh, it is uh, a good thing for us to go on record as firmly being in opposition to this kind of behavior on the part of uh, our fellow citizens. Thank you. Okay, and I'll be looking for a Motion to pass this resolution. And then we can go on to the comments that people are lining up to say. So moved. Second. We have a first and a second. Okay, in the chat box then, we will start with Council Member Stewart. Yeah, I would like to um, move that we amend this and add uh, a request to the Sammamish Police Foundation to remove the imagery of the thin blue line off of their website. I know that that imagery uh, apparently has some 
historic meaning to the police, but we know that unfortunately white supremacist groups have hijacked that symbol and that does not make our community feel included or welcome. And that isn't, I don't believe that that is the uh, community policing um, that we want, that's not the message we want to send. Anytime we use imagery of a white supremacist group, it's going to make people be afraid. Um, and I'd also like to say that um, I know that some of those are, some of those images are, again, historically have meant something different, but the swastika for 3,000 years was a symbol of hope and light and power. And then the Nazis co-opted it, and we don't use it anymore. And unfortunately, that's how it works. So I would like to add on here, be it further resolved, that we request the Sammamish Police Foundation to remove the thin blue line from all of their imagery. <clears throat> okay, I'm not hearing a second to that, so I'm gonna move on with comment. Council Member Ross. Yeah, thank you very much. My, my wife immigrated to the United States in 1986 from Shanghai, China. She since has, she got a degree in China and then re-educated herself in America and became a U.S. citizen, US citizen before we got married. Uh, she has, when I was with her in Chicago, when I relocated with my co company, I experienced something that really shocked me is during the SARS epidemic or pandemic, she was on a bus with to the train station, which is effectively our neighbors, and she coughed. And someone mocked her for SARS or, or laughed at her and said SARS. That was hurtful. It, it, I didn't think it would be hurtful just without the experience itself, but it really was. And that may seem very benign, but what Asians are suffering today with the COVID pandemic is amplified significantly. So I really support this motion, we have 20% of our citizens are Asian descent and welcome in our community. I'm married to one. Thank you very much. Couldn't agree more. Council Member Gamblin. So I, mine was just to comment on the quality of the noise there, Karen, the quality of, of somebody's input, so. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Deputy Mayor? I don't think I'm in the queue. I was just, we, I think we were commenting that Pam's audio when she was speaking was really poor. We could, oh, okay. didn't hear very well. Okay, I'm seeing that now, thank you. Okay, um, is there any other comments? Were okay. you guys able to hear what I said when I spoke? Yeah, you can, you did, you were yes. able to hear it, but it was scratchy. Okay, is this better? Yes. Yes. Okay, great, thanks. And I just wanna say if there is um, anything that we can ever do, um, to me, a proclamation um, is something that the least that we can do. If we ever have got any citizen that is ever feeling fearful or intimidated or in any way afraid, then um, this is the least that we can do to, to help in any way um, to make that better. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm happy that we were able to do this. And so I will be voting in favor of this motion. So we have a motion on the floor and we have a second. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Excellent. Okay, next up we have got an update from our emergency management. Um, Andrew, are you on the line? Yes, I am, Mayor. Thank you, can you hear me? Yeah, I can, and you've got lots to tell us, so take it away. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor, City Council, uh, City Manager. My name is Andrew Stevens. I'm the emergency <laughs> manager with Eastside Fire and Rescue. I am pleased, extremely pleased tonight to announce that 
the our efforts to stand up a mass vaccination site here on east side um, here serving east side communities is now a reality um, through a partnership with city of sammamish east side fire and rescue um, and city of Issaquah, and most importantly the snoqualmie tribal nation um, we are opening our mass vaccination site at lake sammamish state park beginning next Monday, April 12th. Um, so this has been, as you know, a work in progress. And uh, the news was released tonight, um, this afternoon. Um, we've opened up appointments and, you know, currently we are still following the phase guide guidelines. So it is not yet open to everyone 18 and over. And we did that purposefully, even for the appointments following April 15th, because we do realize that vaccine access has been problematic. Um, and being able to provide these first two weeks of appointment slots now for everyone who is eligible currently will really give them a leg forward um, once you know the eligibility is eight, everyone 18 and over. And I say 18 and over because we are doing the Moderna shot at this location. And that is approved for people 18 and over, whereas the Pfizer is the shot that is approved for individuals 16 and over. Um, but going back to the site, um, we are excited. We have, I think the registration has been open for about two and a half hours now. And we've already secured over 800 appointments. Uh, so this has been shared throughout Sammamish, throughout Issaquah, throughout the Snoqualmie Valley. Um, and it really capitalized on the partnership that we have with the Snoqualmie tribe. Um, for the past several months, um, Eastside Fire and Rescue has been delivering vaccine. We've been working with King County Public Health um, and obtaining vaccine for our mobile vaccination teams. And we've been targeting those highest risk populations, vulnerable seniors, uh, nursing homes, adult care facilities, um, people who cannot leave their house and go to a vaccination clinic, whether it was in Seattle, whether it was in um, Auburn or any of the other locations you've seen open up or stood up around the county or possibly around the state. I hear stories of people having to drive to other counties to secure a location. We saw that as a problem um, and we wanted to help. Um, about two months ago, the Columbia Tribe reached out to us and as a sovereign nation, they were able to receive vaccine directly from the state. And they wanted to host vaccination clinics on the reservation land at the, at the casino and but they didn't have vaccinators who could do that job. So Eastside Fire reached out to them and said, we will more than happily be those vaccinators. So for the past six weeks, we've delivered over 5,000 vaccines at their clinics on Saturdays and Sundays and smaller Wednesday clinics. When we had the opportunity to stand up the Lake Mammoth site and we were um, unable at that time to secure vaccines through King County Public Health due to statewide shortages, and uh, a prioritization um, focusing on other parts of the region in King County, the Suquamish tribe um, filled that gap. They stepped up to the plate and they said, we're gonna order more vaccine. We would like to move our vaccine clinic uh, away from the casino onto the Lake Sammamish site. And then the Suquamish vaccine partnership uh, was formed. So they put in an order last week, we got the secured allocation of 3000 doses for our first two weeks. And that's when we put out the word today that this site will open next Monday. And again, that site will be open from Monday through Friday from 930 to five. And it's gonna continue um, for the unforeseeable future until we ensure that our populations are protected. Um, and as new phases of categories of eligibility open up, we will continually update that site. Um, so we are excited about this partnership and I'm excited to see it being shared across the community groups. Um, this is the first community led mass vaccination site in all of Eastern King County. So it really fills an unmet need. And um, you might have saw in the news earlier today that you know other sites like Lumen Field are seeing a, a mass increase in doses. They're, you're gonna see um, more and more, and that's what we're hoping for as a nation, that we're continuing to get ahead of some of this fourth surge you might be seeing, this increase in numbers. Um, and we're going to hopefully get ahead of that by you know, allowing people to not have to go into Seattle, to not have to drive into Southern King County, to not have to 
scourge the internet trying to find an appointment when we can offer it locally in their backyard. And on top of that, we're going to continue our mass vaccination teams. We're also exploring options with the, with the Snoqualmie tribe for additional doses where we can do smaller pop-up clinics around our service area as well in the communities that are not at the Lake Sammamish site, but possibly 100 vaccines at um, a cultural center, 100 vaccines at uh, a senior center uh, throughout our service area. So our options are continuing, and I think it's a breath of fresh air for a lot of people who need a vaccine. And this is right now is our most number one, you know, priority is to get shots in people's arms. So very excited about this. Um, so I, a little bit off script tonight, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. It seems like we're plenty in the queue. Excellent, thank you. Excellent job, Andrew. Um, okay, uh, first up we've got Council Member Stewart. You're on mute. There we go. Okay, sorry, it, uh, it wasn't letting me get off mute. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much. I wanna uh, say thank you to the Snoqualmie Tribe, thank you to Eastside Fire and Rescue and the City of Issaquah for working on this. Uh, I have two questions. One question is uh, a matter of funding. I know that we have been reserving um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 or $550,000 for this. Uh, but I did go back uh, and listen to the meeting where we voted on creating um, the, uh, the, basically the agreement to put this together. And uh, the fire chief mentioned that we would not uh, be on the hook for anything. Uh, it would be a maximum of $100,000 to put all of this together. So I was wondering if you could speak to that disparity between the maximum of $100,000 liability and the $550,000 that we've been uh, holding uh, aside for this effort. Yeah, I'm going to have to go back and look at that because I'm not sure exactly what the fire chief said that you're referencing. We originally had established an agreement, um, a cost share for the mobile vaccination teams, and then later came in with the agreement for the CPOD, the mass vaccination site, which included that larger number. So that could be the difference that you're citing. Okay, yeah, if you could get us that information, that would be great, because that's a, a pretty large difference there. Uh, and then the second question is one that uh, conversation we've been having on email, and I was wondering if you could address how we'll make sure that at this site we are uh, striving for equity and making sure that, you know, we're getting the word out and we're getting access uh, to all of the demographic groups, especially uh, given the resolution that we just passed. How are we making sure that our communities of color are getting vaccinated at a proportionate rate because I know that has been a challenge up until this point and those are the same communities that have actually been hit harder by, uh, by the virus. And so we definitely wanna make sure that we are getting vaccines to our communities of color. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, we want to make sure that vaccines go into arms of the most vulnerable. Some of the initial feedback we received when this uh, ability to register went live was you have appointments for the 16th, but I still need to meet the medical eligibility questions for phases now. I will be eligible come the 16th because I'm 19 years old and healthy. Um, we know that's going to be a problem. So that's why we chose, purposely chose for this release, the first two weeks to, in, to limit it to who is eligible now for that entire duration, because that will give 3,000 individuals a chance to get their foot in the door right away. We are also working hand in hand with the human services representatives from Sammamish and the city of Issaquah and the Snoqualmie tribe to ensure that they are in contact with the most vulnerable populations providing uh, additional, uh, providing the outreach and additional languages. We're gonna have signage at our site in additional languages. We're gonna have the ability to uh, partner with King County Public Health on their language line. So uh, when folks come to the site, it is available to them. And one of the things, you know, just this evening, I emailed Rita as soon as the site went live. I know she's been reaching out, Rita is the human service representative for uh, Sammamish. I know she's been reaching out to those most vulnerable populations um, and communicating with them. And we think about 
you know, restaurant groups, um, rest who are eligible now, critical workers. A lot of them are within that BIPOC population. Um, and a lot of them didn't know that they were eligible. So that outreach is ongoing daily. They're sharing the information that we share when it does become available. And again, this mass vaccination site is one of three strategies. We are going to look at establishing pop-up clinics specifically at these maybe vulnerable locations. Uh, it could be a high density apartment complex. It could be a cultural center. It could be a temple. Um, could be uh, an adult community or senior living community where previously our mass vaccination teams were not eligible to go because of some of the parameters uh, King County Public Health had placed on it. Public Health to get this message out. Even though we're getting our vaccine from the Snoqualmie tribe. Uh, a few days later, King County Public Health said, you know what, we would like to support this site eventually uh, in May. And we're gonna continue that conversation to how can they support through equity, through outreach, through their translation services, the same job, basically help us continue that uh, mission of making sure that we're reaching the most vulnerable populations. Great, and also um, can we throw in their transportation because um, it's not as if there are a lot of buses that go to uh, the Sammamish State Park. So it would be great to make sure that people can get there. Um, those, again, would likely be the people who would um, have the hardest time getting anywhere. So if we're not, if we can't get to them through a pop-up, can we offer when people call to get information if they need a ride, can we be helping them with that? Because I worry, I worry about that, right? Whether, if you can't get to Seattle, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you can get to the Samantha State Park. So how can we help with that as well? I think that would be a, an awesome addition to that. And yeah, we can look into that. Great, thank you, Andrew. Okay, next it's Council Member Odell. <clears throat> thank you. Andrew, thank you for that very uplifting report. It's been a long time coming and I'm really glad uh, we are where we are today. And. I also want to give a special shout out to the Snoqualmie tribe who, uh, again, are proving that they're uh, fabulous next door neighbors to the city of Sammamish. They've been a, a major partner in the Coconut Work Group as well and are very, very community oriented. This means an awful lot to uh, people who have struggled to find places to get inoculated. My wife and I stood in the ice fog coming off of Lake Sammamish up at Eastgate the day at, the last day it snowed in Sammamish uh, for six hours to get our shot. And people have been driving to the other end of the state to do it. So having this locally is gonna be a really good thing. Uh, I agree with Council Member Stewart, we need to find a way to make uh, it easier for people to access these sites. I do have to say though, I think uh, Route 269 does run right by the park uh, Metro Route 269. So that would be one way. Often though, the problem is getting to the bus stop at the other end, uh, particularly for elderly and infirm people. But uh, I think we can find a way to do that. One thing, and Andrew, and that is I hope you guys are planning on keeping this operation alive well into the fall, because I think we're gonna be into boosters by then. Anyway, congratulations, good job, well done. Yeah, absolutely, Council Member. Uh, thank you for those comments. We've initially signed a six month lease um, agreement with the uh, Lake Sammamish State Park with the option to extend. We built this site knowing that this could last for months and we are ready to do so. Um, we have a plan to scale up if necessary from two lanes to four lanes to six lanes and um, with, the, with the support of the tribe and future support of King County Public Health, I think we'll have every opportunity to do that. I think one of the advantages we have through going through this process independently is we've built all of uh, the systems, we've signed all the agreements, we've been able to do this all ourselves to ensure that even if, you know, one, we can stand up for the long haul, whether new populations such as children or, you know, pediatrics can go into a mass vaccination site. That's another massive population that's gonna be served. Boosters like you, uh, you know, gave an example for variants in the future. We'll be ready to do that as well. And Eastside Fire has treated this as our number one priority besides suppression activities 
um, for the last several months. And we're going to continue to do that and continue to make that commitment. So definitely appreciate the support, and uh, we're going to continue until this thing is over. Okay, and uh, Andrew, just for clarification, you are still going to be utilizing the mobile unit, correct, for those who cannot get out of uh, their homes to get to the uh, sites. So as we find those, you will, you will be continuing to use the mobile units. Yeah, absolutely. Our mobile units are in the field almost every day. Great. Okay, next up is Council Member Gamblin. Yeah, I'll be real brief. Andrew, um, congratulations on this. Um, I don't know whether people have a real realization of how many different entities and partners had to be pulled together, everybody with disparating um, priorities, and to make something like this happen and to make it happen in a relatively short time, um, it, it's pretty amazing. Um, we need a mass, a mass vaccination site down here in the Sammamish Squaw area. And um, as you said, we did it, you did it all yourselves. And so again, kudos, putting this together is a pretty big undertaking and done well, and it's gonna be a great help to the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's great that we're um, getting a site that's far closer to where our residents are um, for accessibility. So this will be good. And I'm most grateful to the Snoqualmie Indian tribe uh, for being so gracious uh, with the doses that they've been allocated as to share them with us. Um, I was on the call yesterday, um, uh, as was Andrew and Celia, and I think the mayor popped on towards the end, so she may have missed this part, but um, Shannon Braddock from the executive's office was on the call and had mentioned um, about doses because, you know, the Snoqualmie tribe has doses, but we're hoping to get some from the county as well to support um, this site. And what Shannon said is they're still not getting the allocation of doses that they need. In fact, what she said is that they are getting one dose for every eligible person right now. Um, so there is some hope, though, that we'll get some doses uh, in the future from the county um, in conjunction with those coming from the Snoqualmie tribe, which will... Um, uh, basically increase our ability to vaccinate more of our population um, and hopefully add on this Saturday and not just have it be Monday through Friday. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Deputy Mayor. And I, I think you just mis misspoke a second. Um, they're actually doing like you said, one for every five people who are eligible. I think you said one for one. Um, oh, no, I said one out of every five. Yeah, okay, sorry. One out of every five eligible persons, yep. Absolutely. Yeah, that is a scary number. And especially when April 15th rolls around, you know that's going to go back. Yes, uh, vaccine access is getting greater, um, but even without knowing how much vaccine the county could support come May 1st or even the first week of May, we're gonna have already put 4,500 shots in arms by that date at the site with working with, with the uh, Snoqualmie tribe. So I'm extremely pleased about that. And uh, that's gonna keep going. Um, we have the ability, we are gonna go Monday through Saturday, um, starting in May at this site. The reason why we didn't start with weekends now is because we're still wrapping up um, second dose boosters at the Suquamish Reservation at the casino <clears throat> for the rest of April. So we're gonna continue that, <clears throat> continue that, <clears throat> excuse me, just a cough, don't worry. <laughs> um, but, and then we will be open Monday through Saturday come May 1. We're gonna give you a chance to get a drink of water there, Andrew. Appreciate that. <laughs> okay, Council Member Ross. Thank you. Everybody just about covered most of the points those, or questions I was gonna raise. So I just, I'm left with, um, thank you, Andrew, for your leadership and everyone, everyone else who was involved. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, Council Member Stewart. You're on mute. There you go. OK. 
Okay, I think we've lost her. Sorry. Oh, there she is. I can't unmute. Okay, we hear you. You can hear me now? I can hear you. I just wanted to clarify that Route 269 does not uh, go to Lake Sammamish Park. So I just wanted to clarify that for the community. Um, and I'm further, looking to hop back up there. I'll further clarify that right now at this time, we're not accepting walk-ups at this location. We are gonna continue to explore transportation options. And like I mentioned, whether that is standing up um, smaller 100 or 200 dose pop-up clinics that will specifically target additionally vulnerable folks. Um, we can definitely explore transportation options, maybe through a public-private partnership, um, and as well as uh, work with those individuals who, where we need to specifically deploy our mobile vaccine teams to homebound individuals or, or individuals without transportation, homeless, um, people experiencing homelessness. We're gonna continue to do that. Um, and then if we cannot fill that gap, we're gonna continue to work with uh, providing them information with people who can. I know that the private clinic uh, over in Redmond at the Microsoft campus does have a partnership, um, has been able to provide some Uber type uh, transportation to that site. So it's gonna, again, there's not a lot of ego in this. If we can come up with a solution, we're gonna do that, um, or we're gonna connect them with people who can. Great, thank you. Thank you. And um, in the time I've been talking, we booked another 100 appointments. So we've almost done 1,000 in the last three hours. That's incredible. Thank you so much, Andrew. You've done an excellent job. Very welcome. Have a wonderful evening. You too. Oh, Councilman Odell, did you have yeah, I just had one thing. Pam said that uh, 269 does not go by the state park. It runs right by Costco to the Issaquah Transit Center. It does not go to the boat launch, but it goes through the state park. That's true. I just pulled it out. Okay. Um, okay, so we are going to move forward on to public comment. Pursuant to the governor's emergency proclamation 20-25, the city is unable to provide an in-person location for the public to listen to the virtual city council meeting this evening. Meetings are still accessible to the public and public comment is able to be submitted. Written public comment will be submitted, can be submitted until 5 p.m. on the day of the meeting. Submit your written comments by email to the city clerk at lhatchie at sammamish.us and the city council at citycouncil at sammamish.us. Verbal comment up to three minutes of public comment may be provided per person live during the meeting. Call the following number and input the access code when prompted by 6.30 p.m. the day of the meeting. The phone number 571-317-3122. The access code of 929-348-197. Yes, thank you, Mayor. We have seven people who have called in to provide public comment tonight. I will unmute callers in the order in which they join the meeting. When it is your turn, you will hear an automated voice say unmuted, and then you will have three minutes to provide comment. 15 seconds before your three minutes is complete, I will provide a time warning. At three minutes, you will be muted. If you called in for the public hearing on the wireless communication facilities this evening, please say so when unmuted. I will place you back on hold and return to you when the council reaches that public hearing. Please start your comment by stating your name and the city you live in for the record. And I will now go ahead and unmute our first caller. All right, first caller, have you called for the public comment, public hearing, or both? Public comment. Great, you have three minutes, you may begin. Sarah Kimsey, I live in Sammamish and have since 1997. I'm furious that the thin blue line imagery is still being used by the Sammamish Police Foundation who operate on city property and that the council is fine with it. Mao Chow used that racist imagery last year with the city logo, so she lied about it on the dais. So this council is worried about protecting model minorities. That's nice, but won't work 
towards helping the most marginalized. Did you ever even have your equity and equality training? It appears not. What an embarrassment of a council you are. Week after week, we watch toxic masculinity on glorious display with gambling screaming and Treen's shouting condescension. I really hope Treen's students aren't watching his behavior. Ross is usually falling asleep, become a bit of a joke. And then we've got Moran who can't run a meeting to save her life and Mal Chow constantly interloping so she can play pretend she's the leader. And where the hell is the city manager? And now we're stuck with Odell. Odell is an out of touch imbecile who thinks reverse discrimination is a thing and obviously hasn't read Vision 2050 wherein peanut buttering affordable housing is exactly what we are supposed to do. Instead, he seems to propose segregation. His own words, quote, parts of the systemic racism we are talking about comes from the fact that everyone is not comfortable with everyone else. And it takes a certain mass of people who look like you and talk like you and think like you for people to be comfortable. I found his comments truly disgusting. He completely misses the point that rich cities like Sammamish have been hoarding opportunities for far too long and can no longer force the brunt of services southward. What is the point of the censure and public admonishment of Pam Stewart at tonight's meeting agenda? You have the votes to do whatever the hell you want, and apparently the city attorney says she no longer works for the city. She works to, to rubber stamp whatever harebrained ideas you six idiots come up with. Stewart questioned the city's ongoing unethical behavior. We all see it. Week after week, you come out of executive session and call the question or go straight to vote without minimal discussion. Stewart was brave enough to say something, even when she knows you six will clobber her. What's worse, Odell was allowed to vote about an executive session wherein he was not present. The city of Sammamish deserved full transparency regarding the appointment and decision-making process surrounding Tom Odell's appointment, after, especially after his overtly racist comments. Public shaming Pam for questioning this process shows our citizens that transparency means nothing to the council of Sammamish. I see. Moving on to our next caller. Caller number two, have you called for the public hearing, public comment, or for both? Public comment. Great, you have three minutes, you may begin. Good evening to all city council members and others present today. My name is Augustina Ives, and I have lived in Sammamish for 13 years now. And I am here today as a resident of our city, but also um, in my role as a therapist at KSARC, the King County Sexual Assault Research Center, and which is a nonprofit that serves all communities throughout King County, including, of course, Sammamish. And I am calling uh, with regards to the uh, Sexual Assault Awareness Month proclamation from the city of Sammamish. And on behalf of our nonprofits, I really want to thank you for being a part of the solution and passing this resolution, this proclamation. I want to share with you that KSARC uh, served nearly 5,000 people in 2020, almost half of whom were children, since many of them live in our own city. Amid the pandemic, we have continued to serve survivors and their families who are facing even more complex challenges. Everything you can imagine, from trying to find a private space to participate in therapy sessions from home, to safety planning with legal advocates whose courts delay their cases, to needing much more emotional and financial support to remain engaged in their own and their child therapy or legal cases, or to simply continue living through these unprecedented times. Sexual abuse and assault are very painful occurrences that are often suffered in silence and isolation because it is so difficult to talk about them. Your leadership, your support, and your willingness to be loud about sexual assault means so much. We can't change what we cannot talk about. By talking about sexual violence, we send an important message to survivors. You are not alone, and your story matters. We're very grateful we can be there for every victim who finds the strength and courage to disclose their abuse, whether it happened recently or years ago. Healing is possible, and ending sexual violence is possible, 
and everyone has a role. And I really want to thank the, the city of St. Amos for your support, your continued financial support, and this proclamation today. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling in. Moving to our next caller. Caller number three, are you uh, speaking to the for uh, public comment, the public hearing on wireless communication facilities, or both? Uh, just public comment. Great. You have three minutes. You may begin. Yes. Uh, my name is Mark Cross. I'm a resident of Sammamish, and I live at 247 208th Avenue Northeast. Uh, good evening, City Council. I want to talk to you tonight about the George Davis Creek Fish Passage Project. I had hoped that this, by finishing this fish project, fast passage project this year, the, the council would then be ready to move on to neighborhood storm drainage projects, addressing problems identified in the Zacoose Creek Basin Plan. I do have two concerns about the uh, George Davis project, though, that I wanted to communicate. First, that I'm concerned that the construction delay to 2022 means that two major construction projects led by two separate jurisdictions will be happening in exactly the same place at the exact same time with the city working both above and below city county parks east lake sammamish trail construction this is a cause of concern for both project schedule and cost the current fish passage project design abandons use of the existing high flow bypass that King County built 25 years ago. It is possible that once the proposed fish passage project is constructed and is in operation, that the need to further control uh, winter storm surges will become apparent. Um, I suggest that the existing high flow uh, bypass on George uh, Davis Creek may be needed as part of future solutions to protect both the investment in George Davis Creek as a kokanee spawning stream and to assist in safely managing urban storm flows. Use the extra time before the contracts for the George Davis Creek Fish Passage Project are let and construction begins to re review st stream flow data with staff and to consider whether the existing high flow bypass should be preserved to provide the city with more flexibility in the future as it works to provide spawning habitat for kokanee and to safely control storm drainage. It is my hope that after this project is launched that the council will make space in the storm drainage capital improvement plan for projects that address storm drainage problems on Thompson Road and in the upper Tamarack neighborhood. These um, previously identified projects will benefit both neighborhood residents and uh, Kokanee in Zacoose Creek. And thank you for your time. I think uh, my wife and I are now going to go watch Perry Mason. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> Okay, moving on to our fourth caller. Uh, caller number four, have you called for public comment, the public hearing, or for both? Public comment. You may begin your comment. Hello, my, my name is Jennifer Coombs, and I live in Sammamish, and I am the executive director of the Sammamish-based 501c3 nonprofit Project 5. Project 5 is a growing nonprofit that specializes in emergency nutrition and crisis kits for medical and financial needs along with clinical nutrition and yoga services for those in need. Thank you for your important consideration of my verbal comment here. I've chosen to approach the city council at this time due to a high need of grant funding for Project Thrive during this pandemic. Families are approaching Project Thrive consistently, and I'm having to turn families to other resources due to lack of funding and donations to support the need. It is imperative at this time to make sure Project Thrive is funded with COVID-19 funding. Project Thrive helps the Mammoth and Eastside families with emergency nutrition and crisis kits due to job losses, medical difficulties, reduced income, and recovery from COVID-19. I must follow stringent public health guidance to maintain safety during this, during this work. Project Thrive is critical and essential by 501c3 nonprofit during this pandemic that has been supported by private donations 
but Project Drive has yet to receive COVID-19 funding after numerous grant proposals sent to the City of Sammamish and City Council. My question for you at this point regards the legal grounding that you have to deny funding to, to a Sammamish 501c3 nonprofit that is legally and genuinely helping Sammamish and Eastside families. Are you allowed to legally discriminate against Project Drive and awarding funding? Are you allowed to discriminate against me as an executive director because I'm a woman, not married, lower income, and a rape survivor? Legally, you can. I don't know of any other reason why funding would be denied. Project Drive follows the rules, and there is funding available to designate to nonprofits in need during this pandemic. As a nonprofit director, I manage the funding, programs, outreach, marketing, finances, the quarterly and annual reporting, and the financial application process to help families in need. I do this without pay currently. This cannot continue because the need in the community is growing. Nonprofits like not Project Drive need funding from various sources, and the city of Sammamish is a correct source to call upon to fulfill these needs. I have made numerous grant proposals to the city, Sammamish City Council all of which were ignored. I'm not clear that you have legal grounds to ignore Project Thrive. I played a very strong role in helping to guide the approval of the $3.6 million COVID-19 funding for the pandemic use to help Sammamish residents, businesses, nonprofits, and pandemic needs, yet Project Thrive is still without COVID-19 funding from the city of Sammamish, the city in which I serve families and live. While Project Thrive has uh, had community donations and financial support is it is imperative to gain funding from this remaining COVID-19 fund at this time. Please consider my comment for your work tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Moving to our fifth caller. Caller number five, have you called for the public comment, public hearing on wireless facilities or for both? I'm calling for the uh, public hearing. Okay, great. I will put you back on mute and we will return to you once we reach that item. Okay, moving on to our last caller. Caller number six, have you called for public comment, public hearing, or for both? Uh, both, please. Both. All right, you may begin your public comment. Hi, this is Mary Wichter, and I've lived in Samantha for 20 years. Tonight, I'm going to talk about septic systems or on-site sewage systems, which are called OSSs. We have infrastructure concerns in Sammamish, um, only due to the lack of stormwater infrastructure and sewer, but there are many old septic systems in our city, including 30, 40 years old, and some that are failing and pre-failing. I have voiced concern about this in the past, and I wanted to remind you that the city of Sammamish has 3,500 septic systems or OSSs in an urban growth boundary. And within the Sammamish Plateau Water District, there's actually 4,200, although they cover part of the city of Issaquah and also unincorporated King County. For Sammamish, this represents about 17% of the total parcels in our city. And um, that, those state numbers are from King County Department of Environmental Health Services. For comparison, the county, King County countywide has only 10% septics. Um, and they don't plan to do sewers in rural areas. Bellevue has only 1,200 and about 500 and Issaquah 400. So we have three to seven to eight times as many septic systems as our cities and we're at 17% and they only have three to 5%. Um, and I also sent a, a map with the email that I sent. So these septics that are pulled, um, as there's a moratorium for Sammamish Plateau water for 90 days and may or may not be continued, um, they will allow people to connect after confirmation of a failing septic system is provided by King County Health Department. However, King County Health Department has extremely limited resources even to respond to calls or situations where septics might be failing or pre-failing. So folks may not even know there is a problem for their own house while down folks, downhill folks can see or smell these indications. So I would suggest the City of Sammamish and SPW might work with King County Board of Health and or Environmental Health Services in Eastgate to ensure there is either sufficient staff experience and testing abilities to be involved in these cases or areas or work out that third-party contract services with valid credentials and experience allowed to look into these and test where there are suspected areas of failures. I'd also like to address critically uh, critical areas which are ge geologically hazardous. 
Um, low impact development is a technique where you put storm water into the ground. However, there are technical infeasibilities. And when you're in a geohazard, all the infiltrating low impact development techniques are supposed to be infeasible. Putting storm water into the ground is not unlike septic into the ground. So if we can't put storm water in, we really shouldn't be putting more new septics in these areas either. And there are historic areas like Inglewood and Tamarack neighborhoods that are zoned R4 and continuing to build it more than they're zoned for. This needs to be fixed in our development to upcoming. Um, and uh, we've only had average rainfall this year, but we saw a lot more water into the uh, ditches alongside Lewis Thompson this year. Um, anyway, I go on to more because I did send an email. I hope you'll listen to these. Thank you, Mary. Um, I want to thank everybody that called in this evening. Um, because I know everybody had to wait quite a bit to, to get on to be heard. So thank you, everybody that called in. Um, okay, the next up, um, we have got, uh, do we have any of this, I know this has gone back and forth, so do we have any um, early executive session this evening? Not that I'm aware of, Mayor. Okay, perfect. Okay, so the next up is consent calendar, so I'm looking for a motion on consent calendar. So moved. So moved. Second. Uh, second, so I have a first and a second, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of acceptance of the consent calendar, say aye. 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 Opposed? Excellent. And we are staying right on target here. So the next up we've got presentation from the Sammamish Plateau Water and Sewer District. And I know I saw them online, so we should have. Uh, Jay Kraus, Jay Regenstrife, um, I believe I saw. Uh, Lloyd and Rika, I believe I saw both of them. Okay, so we should have Water Commis Commissioners Lloyd Wa Warren. Whew. And um, I thought I saw Rika on there. Is she on there as well? Okay, so uh, Jay, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. I'm gonna uh, let good you, evening. Uh, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, City Council members, uh, City Manager, and uh, members of the public in attendance. It's been a while since the district um, had a chance to attend a board meeting, and I just wanted to thank you for giving us uh, your attention and time this evening. And as the Mayor indicated, I'm joined tonight by Jay Regenstrife, our Planning Engineer, um, Board President Rekha Hushangi, and I don't know if Lloyd Warren is on or not, but he was trying to, trying to tune in. Um, so I'm, I'm going to share screen if that's okay. Uh, I don't know. Do I need permission, Mike or uh, um, Dave, to do that, or can I just pull it up? You should be able to just pull it up. Okay. Let me start a slideshow. So I was asked to attend the meeting. Um, to uh, brief the City Council on the North Sewer Service Area Moratorium in the Sammamish Plateau Water and Sewer District. And maybe it will advance. Here we go. So I'm gonna start by kind of defining the challenge that the district is dealing with uh, presently. After many decades of planning sewage conveyance facilities with King County. King County deprior deprioritized a major capital improvement project that was planned for decades to serve the district and meet uh, long-term conveyance needs. Improvements are required so that the district can continue to support growth. And in spite of uh, our efforts to coordinate planning with the county, we, because of the deprioritization of the project, we find ourselves reaching capacity limits in what we refer to as the North Sur service area of the district. When it was realized capacity limits were being met, the Board of Commissioners uh, declared a moratorium on February 22nd. It's a 90-day moratorium. 
and uh, during which time the district is evaluating options. And those options are um, projects that have evolved from an interim improvement evaluation that was completed in January of 2021. So the North Sur service area on this slide, unfortunately I don't have control of a pointer very well, here we go. The North Sur service area is the portion of the city served by the district in salmon color. And when we talk about a moratorium, it's important to note what it applies to and what it doesn't apply to. Currently the moratorium does not apply to anybody who um, has already secured a certificate of availability from the district or prepaid connection charges to the district. In essence, once you've done so, you've vested in your um, right to connect to the system. The moratorium, however, does apply to, um, and let me go back, it also does not apply to folks on septic that for health reasons would be required to connect the public sewer because of a failing septic system. However, the moratorium does apply currently to the issuance of new certificates of sewer availability. That includes those that would want to build a new house, remodel a house that would require a uh, certificate of availability due to an expansion of plumbing or new connections to convert from septic if you do not have a failing septic system. So one of the fundamental um, issues at play here is our relationship with the King County Regional Conveyance System. The map I've pulled up um, on the left hand, whoop, the map I pulled up on the left hand panel, um, if you have a keen eye, anything in red is regional conveyance facilities. Please note, um, although you, you know, it may be somewhat um, uh, fine in nature, but please note where the red lines extend throughout the metropolitan region. And if you turn your attention to the right hand thumbnail, please note where they don't extend. And that would be primarily in the city of Sammamish and the Sammamish Plateau Water and Sewer District. As I indicated, the affected sewer basins are referred to as our North Sewer Service Delivery Area in Salmon. The project that was deprioritized by King County is what is commonly referred to as the Sammamish Plateau Diversion. And if you notice on this inset, um, it, it is a uh, sewer, sewer conveyance main depicted in gold. And um, ironically, that sewer main is the very main that would have supported continued build out of the North Sewer Service Area. We have a lot of history with planning for the Sammamish Plateau Diversion. In fact, dating back to the late 50s, um, metropolitan plans uh, in the region called for sewage from the district to be split and for a portion about half to go south and half to go north to the um, Sammamish Plateau Diversion. Uh, historically, from 1970 to date, all of our comprehensive plans as a district, the sewer comprehensive plans that is, are required to be approved by King County and King County is mandated that we design and call for our flows to be split to go north and south. The most recently adopted sewer comprehensive plan was in 2013. And when that plan was adopted, we placed special emphasis on engaging King County to identify project timeframes, project triggers, and we did our best to fully engage the county to express the district's needs to have the Sammamish Plateau diversion delivered in time to meet the growing conveyance needs of the city and the district. However, although we are consistent in our expression of need, um, in spite of it, in 2017, um, the, the project was removed from the county's conveyance system improvement plan, in essence defunded, moved out to 2050 to 2070, and unfortunately that was done with no notification or engagement to the district. And um, from 2016 on, the one thing that has been consistent is the inconsistency. Um, we were told it was funded in 2016, then we were told it was actually underway and chartered, which is a county process. Then without notice, we were it was unfunded in 17, 
and we weren't advised of it until April of 2018. And at that time, the county indicated that, and they've recognized in correspondence that um, their, their decision impacted our local sewer system and they were to work with us on mitigating those impacts. However, this is now uh, devolved into rhetoric in 2021 where it's framed as a local problem. Um, as such, um, we're dealing with it locally because we don't have any choices at the moment. So just some of the recent events that have led to the moratorium, uh, I'm gonna first describe the, the fact that we have a very complex sewer system. The North Sewer Service Delivery Area has three primary lift stations that um, are impacted by uh, the growth in the district and the city. And sewage in the northeasterly portion of the North Sewer Service Area generally flows to what we call the Inglewood lift station, which is a pump station. It, it moves uh, waste hydraulically by pumping it. It then flows down Inglewood Hill Road uh, through a what's called a force main, a pressurized main. It hits a gravity main. It then hits another pump station called the North Lake lift station. It's pumped again a distance. It then hits another lift station. <laughs> and it's pumped further. In essence, it's a very complex uh, intertwined system and um, it relies greatly on hydraulics to move sewage flow within the district and the sea. From 2019 to 2021, we were working on an interim improvement analysis to identify ways to mitigate the deprogramming of the Northern Diversion Project. Unfortunately, in 2019, we began experiencing um, conveyance capacity issues. The first time we hit what we call a trigger was December 20th of 2019, where we exceeded the um, design capacity of our North Lake lift station, which is uh, 1,200 gallons per minute. We, in, in December of 2019, we hit um, a flow of 13, a little bit over, over 1,300 gallons a minute. At that time, we didn't know if it was just incidental due to a heavy rain or what other uh, extenuating circumstances there were. However, um, since 12 20 of 2019, we've had um, five events where flow has exceeded what we uh, call a trigger for the North Lake Lift Station. And as a result of that, the board in February determined that it was appropriate to declare a moratorium and take some time to um, review the situation and just do their diligence. That 90-day moratorium was followed by an emergency declaration on March 1st to secure engineering services. Those engineering services um, were approved and we are currently under contract with a consulting engineer to help uh, evaluate improvements to the local system um, both during the current moratorium and moving forward. So our challenges aren't your typical flows. They're not when it's when on a day like today when it's dry. Our challenges are when it rains. So when we hit those triggers in 2019, 2020, and 2021, it's during the winter months. And the, the exceedance of our flow triggers is related to ion, infiltration and inflow, um, commonly referred to as I&I. &I. And infiltration is groundwater that ends up in the sewer mains. It comes from cracks and defects in our underground infra infrastructure. Inflow is clear water that enters the sewer system from privately um, owned assets. And that could be roof drains, um, storm, storm drains that might be um, cross-connected from parking lots, um, it could be from manhole covers that uh, pick holes are exposed. But in essence, there's, there, you know, there's kind of a sarcastic uh, way of framing I&I. &I. There's two kinds of sewer systems, those, those that leak and those that will leak. It, it's inevitable that every sewer system is going to have I&I. &I. When we review our sewer system, though, we actually have a very tight system. The uh, graphic I'm sharing with you is a map of the King County um, regional conveying system where the county goes out and actually measures I&I. &I. For Sammamish Plateau, we have some of the lowest incidence of I&I. &I. Um, and so it's really not a matter of a lack of local stewardship. It doesn't mean we can't continue to assess I&I &I to mitigate 
um, the surcharging of our system, but compared to other areas of the region, if you look at this map, those areas that are not yellow or green have extremely high I and I loading on the regional system and local sewer systems. So we do have a pathway out of the moratorium and uh, the pathway that we're currently focused on will deal very heavily with metrics. Metrics that evaluate what is really coming from I and I versus domestic flows, domestic as in uh, non-peak flows when it's raining. Um, we are looking at enhancing our measurement of within the system to try and evaluate where I and I may be coming from. Um, a couple of years ago, we installed a, an AMI water metering system and we're beginning to leverage that technology to understand what's, you know, what is in the source system that comes from people's plumbing versus what comes from infiltration and inflow. The basis of, the, of lifting the moratorium will um, be impacted by establishing more advanced flow triggers and capacity triggers. Those capacity triggers will identify if improvements are made, how much more flow can we accept? How many more connections can we allow? They will also recognize the timing of improvements in relation to when it's safe to perhaps allow additional um, connections and flows to tie into the system um, because we have projects that will come online before the rainy season hits again. The design and implementation of improvements is going to include immediate improvements, which are uh, intended to provide immediate relief if, if they can be identified. The key there is to try and avoid overflows because if sewage is not going in the system, it's going out of the system. We will also identify interim improvements that improve the capacity incrementally. And uh, finally, we're gonna be looking at long-term improvements. And long-term improvements will include engaging King County because we need, we need assurance on long-term improvements. The inconsistent programming of regional improvements has really been challenging for the district. And um, the Board of Commissioners is concerned that uh, we, may, we may construct interim improvements only to find that the county hasn't kept, kept up the pace to construct long-term improvements. The district will also look at permanent and long-term improvements independent of the county because we believe there's some more cost-effective options um, contrasted with the Sammamish Plateau diversion that should be considered um, as a permanent regional solution. So just as a matter of note, um, some of the improvements have already been scoped out as part of the interim improvement evaluation completed in January. The problem is because of the cascading effect of sewage conveyance, we have multiple areas of the system that will be touched. Um, anything on Inglewood Road, it's not anticipated there would be any, any work or disruption there. It's everything that flows from Inglewood Hill Road going south, and we have some tentative timeframes in place. Um, ironically, though, the, the projects we can implement soonest will not add capacity to the system, but if we don't uh, complete earlier projects, we're just gonna move the bottleneck further down the road. And I also note, um, if the Northern Diversion had been built, which would follow this general alignment, we would have diverted everything from the Inglewood Hill lift station. We would have no flow capacity um, problems going south. In essence, we would not be dealing with what we're dealing with today. So I'm gonna close by just um, addressing some comments that we've heard in the community and, uh, and, and clarification. First of all, the length of the moratorium. Right now it's a 90 day moratorium. Um, we believe there are solutions that can be put in place in um, three years or less, but what it is not is a 25 to 30 year moratorium. Second, is this a regional issue or a local issue? Um, I guess on this one, where you stand depends upon where you sit. And again, I'll refresh everyone's memory of where the regional conveyance system exists and where it doesn't exist. Um, I believe the district, uh, district feels it is a regional issue, not a local issue. And the lack of regional infrastructure has contributed to this. Um, periodically, customers ask us why are our rates different than others? And just as a, a matter of uh, benchmarking, we did a study back in September 2016 
we identified that one of the one of the main drivers of district sewer rates is a lack of access to regional infrastructure. This is a survey independently commissioned by the district and Cascade Water Alliance. Out of the survey group, we had the lowest number of connections to the regional conveyance system. We have one connection. Bellevue, 34, Issaquah, 24, Kirkland, 32, Redmond, 60, Tukwila, 25. What this means is we're constructing infrastructure because the regional government, government agency is not. It, it impacts our rates. Customers do end up subsidizing the regional, the regional conveyance system. And finally, there's been reference at times to the transfer of assets to King County. And um, we had been engaging King County on, in an effort to transfer assets and bring equity to the district and our customers. In fact, King County has a definition of what qualifies for transfer of assets. And it, it's, it's a basin standard. It has to do with uh, the acreage size of uh, free flowing basins. Ironically, we qualify and everything on this map was which was uh, generated by the county in blue if you can follow my cursor is eligible for transfer to the county and we were on a path to move these assets to the county because if they want to wanted to construct interim improvements to save the regional agency money and we qualify why not take over the assets that you're that you're going to be improving and ironically if you follow the cursor everything that we're looking to improve locally really should be owned regionally. Unfortunately, two weeks ago, King County completely broke off discussions on any further asset transfer. And uh, it's extremely concerning because again, it um, speaks to geographic disadvantage of our resident, your residents and our customers. So with that, um, I just wanna uh, remind everybody that our information that we're trying to share with the public is updated periodically. We've created a micro website. It's called let's talk about our sewer.org. Um, please go there for um, the district side of the story uh, and updates. And uh, with that, um, I'm going to pause and open it up for questions. And in the event I can't answer a question uh, uh, because it's engineering related, I'm going to draw Jay Regan stripe into the conversation. And I'm happy to, happy to go back to any slides if anybody has any uh, questions that are relevant to the uh, graphics I've shared. Okay, Jay, I don't know if you see over in the chat box, um, but we've got a list of questions starting with Council Member Gamblin. Uh, I don't have that. Well, maybe I had a bounce That's off. okay, I, I'll call them for you. Council Member Gamblin. Yeah, hey, thank you, Jay, for coming in tonight. This is definitely on our minds. You indicated that um, we had hit capacity in the recent past several times. You said capacity limits were being met. I assume this means with our current volume, um, not projected volume that would occur with additional hookups. Is that correct? That's true, Mr. Yamo. Okay. When you mentioned prepaid connection charges, does that mean somebody who's paid in full and they're ready to go? Does that mean somebody who's given, given a deposit in, as, in the hope that they may go sometime in the future? Generally, it's somebody who's paid in full. Okay. And um, more hookups mean more volume. Is, is that correct? I just want to make sure I'm correct there. Mm -hmm. it re yes, it does result in additional loading of the system. Okay. So a question, um, if we're already at 100%, um, how will the system handle more flow? Because unlike, say, something uh, like traffic, um, if you exceed traffic, you just get a traffic backup and people are a little late to work. Um, when sewers exceed capacity, the, roads, the results are catastrophic. I, I've seen them back in the East Coast where I lived. Sewers, when they back up, they back up into people's houses, they come up through their toilets, they outflow onto the roads. Um, there's all kinds of places where that, that um, that pressure backs the sewage up and pushes it. And I've seen, again, houses completely first floor full of sewage. So my question is, if we're already at 100%, um, does it make sense to keep adding more capacity when we know the results could be bad? That is something the board is currently considering. 
but your observations are are accurate that um, there there is um, risk in continuing to add new flows and new customers. We're optimistic that what what I refer to as immediate improvements can provide some relief with that. Um, and I, I don't want to get too deep in the woods on what those immediate uh, improvements would be, but they, in essence, would provide storage to provide some relief um, against added flows that may push capacity even further. And and also that, that, that could put those capacity constraints, we're hitting, it, it, it's rain intensity driven. And so if we have a mild year, it may not be as bad, but it, you know, really when we have long um, extended durations of precipitation and higher volumes, that's really when the system's um, challenged. Right. Well, you just made the back hair on the back of my neck stand up, literally, Jay. Um, can the district guarantee that the North Sewer Service Area has enough capacity that if we do have a major rain event and we're already at capacity, that we can handle the overflow without some of these disastrous results I'm talking about? I don't think anybody can guarantee that. Well, if a system's at an 80% capacity or 70% or 60%, you have some elasticity built into it. And I'm sorry, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, Jay. I'm just really trying to get a grip on what we're talking about. So if a system has some elasticity, if it's not at full capacity, and you have a major rain event, which we rain a lot in Sammamish, right? So if we have a major rain event and we're at 100% many times, then we don't have any ability to absorb more into that system at this point. So my question is, I'm concerned that we're at 100%. I'm concerned that sewage overflow, um, and when that happens, is a real big problem for residents. Um, I'm trying to make sure our residents protected here. I realize council doesn't control this, you folks do, but I, we still bear a lot of responsibility for the health and welfare of our residents. Um, and so I wanna mention that I'm concerned that we're at 100%, we could have major rain events, it could push us well over um, if they're bigger than your last rain events. And I'm concerned that the desire to honor these prepaid connection certificates, in other words, new hookups and new volume, will, in essence, add even more volume to a system that's already hitting 100% when we get in these situations, which we do, and thus endanger our residents, their health, their welfare, their property, their, um, their infrastructure. So. I just wanted to make that very clear that it's a really big concern because I've seen this before when you have these sewer floods happen. And so I, I trust you guys are looking carefully at this and whatever we can do to help and back you up. I understand you guys who are put in this situation by a, a lack of follow through on funding. I'm not pointing any fingers, but at a certain point, it does become the responsibility to mitigate so that you can at some level say, yes, we can say if there's a major storm, we're not gonna have these problems. Then rather than say, hey, by the way, we need a couple of good years because if we have a bad year, we're really in big trouble and we're adding more capacity. So anyway. Good, good, good observations. And we are, we are, um... You know, I'm going to take a fresh look at I and I abatement in spite of our system being pretty tight. Um, you know, if there are things that we can identify, um, you know, where it's roof drains, parking lots that are tied into the system, things that are adding to the loading, those are actual solutions. It's just very, very challenging and very difficult. We've got 68 miles of underground mains in this basin, um, over five, you know, 5,000 private sewer accounts. Every one of those is a potential source. Yep. Well, I know you're working the problem, Jay, and I know the board over there is working the problem, and uh, I can see your consternation. So, again, if we can help out, um, let us know. Very good. Thank you. Okay, next I have got Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, 
the J, both J, both J's that we have. Um, appreciate you both being on with us this evening. Um, good to see you. Um, I do have a question, and this comes by way of staff. Um, so, can a project that holds a certificate of sewer availability and is listed as having a partial sewer capacity charge payment simply pay the balance of the sewer capacity charge to the status of full payment and become exempt exempt from the moratorium? I'm going to ask Jay Regan Stride to respond to that because she deals closer with those um, applications. Okay. Okay. Okay, here I am. Um, yes, yeah, so under our current developer extension agreement, which is where most of the certificates of availability um, that you're referring to for developments would be, when they enter in uh, to the developer extension agreement, they're required to pay a portion of their general facility charge. And the terms of the agreement allow them at any time to pay up to the full amount. We require that they pay it before we'll approve their final construction documents. But there isn't anything in the agreement that prohibits them from paying um, early uh, before those are ready. So yes, they could. So they would be exempt from the moratorium. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. And then, so then I would assume that um, the sewer capacity that has been identified as a deficiency, um, would that have an effect on the validity of already issued certificates? I'm assuming that answer is no, that they would be exempt from the moratorium as well. Is that correct? I'm not 100% certain I got the question there, but... So, somebody that already has an issued certificate of sewer availability, okay. they can proceed forward, correct? Correct. Even if they haven't started construction. Okay, very good. Thank you. Councilmember Odell. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have uh, several questions. First of all, if the uh, Northern Diversion Line were to happen overnight, in, in miraculously, how much, uh, what would be your utilization of the Southern Line as it stands now? We would still need the Southern Line because we would not divert everything to the North. No, that we would not. We would not need to improve those assets presently, though. But uh, my point is, is that after you did divert whatever you were originally thinking about diverting northward, how much capa excess capacity would remain in the southern line? Jay, I don't know that we have any uh, measurements on that right now, but I'm going to okay. defer to you. So I'm going to ask a clarification. So we have. We have a southern connection to King County, the, or the southern King County connection. Are you mm -hmm. talking about the capacity in our system or the capacity in the King County system? Actually, I could ask both questions, to be honest with you. Uh, what I'm focusing on right now is what's in the uh, Samantha Plateau waters control. If, okay. uh, for instance, the north, north line would be materialized, how much excess capacity does that free up in the southern line? Um, the system that we currently have installed along the lakefront, because everything that's, almost everything that's above the lakefront would now be going to the north, um, would be able to continue to flow through the existing system. Uh, I believe we still have a few required improvements, but I think they were like 15 to 20 years out. I'm sorry, I don't have a specific answer to that. I've, I've not been looking at it in those terms recently, so I don't have that schedule hard in my mind. Okay, fair enough. Uh, second kind of question. Earlier tonight, Mary Wichter, who is a frequent commenter of, at the council, uh, said there are 3,500 uh, homes in Samantha that are still on septic. <clears throat> I don't know if you agree with that number or not, but I suspect most of them are in your area, service area. Uh, if they were to connect all of a sudden, I assume that would break the bank. Um, so some of those, the, the number is, 
probably not precise, but it's it's not that far off, so we can just use that for talking purposes. Some of those are actually in the southern sewer system in the okay. southern area, so not all of them. Um, for the within the entire district of those that are on septic, about 400 have sewer available without further uh, extension of sewer system. You know, so for somebody to connect today, we only really have about 400, and that's across the entire district. We normally see across the entire district about uh, about 40 a year that transfer. Okay, and then uh, Sumelius reaches full build out uh, at some point in the future. Uh, hopefully, our sewer system will be keeping up with it. We have to increase your capacity by 25%, 50%, double it. Any idea on that issue? Um, the number of sewer customers would probably, I'm thinking um, it would not quite double, but the sewer would be growing at the, at the same time. And there are, there are some additional capacity improvements that are going to be needed. Uh, but those would be phased in as growth was occurring. Okay. I'm just, just concerned that if we do a rich build out and we have all these uh, septic systems connected, the problem may be a lot bigger than we're talking about right now. Am I right on that or not? Um, I'm not certain I'd fully, you know, if they were to all connect at once, yeah, it would certainly exacerbate the current situation, but we don't, that is likely um, because of the extensions that are required. And uh, that's why when we do our comprehensive plans, we try and predict what's coming in the next six to 10 years and what other improvements do we need to have in place within our system to okay. accommodate them as they come online. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have Council Member Stewart. Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks for the presentation. Very helpful. A couple of questions. Um, uh, when a trigger is hit, so you have a, a notation on there that there's a, a peak capacity and the trigger occurs just before that, right? Which is good, right? You want that trigger. What happens? Mm -hmm when, like, what is triggered exactly? Okay. Jay? Okay, so I'm just waiting to see if you're gonna tackle that one. Okay. Anybody so, that answers you is Jay, just so you know. So, yeah, <laughs> just say Jay, see who speaks first. Um, so when we, in, the, in this particular situation, the trigger that we've been looking at and speaking to is at our North Lake lift station. And the North Lake lift station normally sees, you know, on a day like today with normal domestic flows, sees about 700 um, gallons a minute. And it's designed to operate at about 900 gallons a minute. Um, when, and that's with just one pump running. And the lift station actually has three pumps. Uh, for the normal, changes that you see in operation. We go up to two pumps, which takes us to between 1,000 and 1,100 gallons a minute to uh, hit the capacity. Um, right now it's 1,200 gallons a minute, and that requires three pumps running. And what's different about that situation is that we actually have to go manually operate the lift station. It, it doesn't go to three pumps automatically. And so that is our, um, physical trigger, if you will, um, in, in how we're actually operating. Even when we've exceeded the triggers, I want to point this out because I've, I've heard other people say, oh, so you had overflows. We have not had any overflows, even exceeding the triggers. We have managed the system to continue to operate without overflows, and that's one of the reasons that we kind of are stopping things at this point to figure out how to best manage to continue that track record. Uh, excellent, so I think you may have just answered my next question and I just wanna scroll down. So I was trying to take notes. Um, you said that you hit the trigger at uh, 1200 
gallons per minute, correct? Um, right. And that the the peak capacity is 1,300 gallons per minute. And you yeah. had, uh, right? Those are, those are reversed. Oh, sorry. The capacity is 1,200 gallons a minute. We had an inflow of 1,300 gallons a minute. Got it, okay, so the capacity is 1,200. You've actually hit an inflow of 1,300. Um, but you also said that a normal day is about 700 gallons per minute. Yes. So, so can, is it safe to assume then that that 600 additional gallons per minute is the inflow and infiltration? Is that correct? The I and I will account for much of that. Um, I, 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 because I'm a detail person, I hesitate to say yes. It's not quite a simple subtraction exercise. Sure, because sure. Well, and that's what I want to understand, though. Like, what? So, because if it were in that ballpark, that's like 40 percent of the capacity we're talking about is coming from I and I. So that's why I want to understand how big of a. I mean, I know you guys were green on the map, and I think it's great that you guys are you know, kind of best in breed in the region, but it still sounds like a lot of the capacity is being used up by I and I, unless there's other things. And if there are, if you could share those, that would be great. You're absolutely correct. It is. I and I is a huge part of managing, of designing a system and managing the flows to the system is that it's, it's not coming from just your regular, what time of day is it, how much water are people using? It's it's from the I and I. That's what stresses. Okay. Um, and I know you talked about um, uh, trying to get some better metrics. Do you not currently have any flow meters throughout the system? And I ask that uh, kind of selfishly. So, uh, as my kids would say, a hundred years ago, um, before <laughs> before I. I uh, started my second career, uh, I worked for an engineering consulting firm and we developed flow meter technology uh, that was used and could very precisely uh, measure changes in flows. Uh, it was actually technically used to, to find cracks on like pipelines because people, you know, when there was a leak in a pipeline, uh, you'd have to wait till somebody, you know, till it was a big enough change that somebody noticed you know, some oil was missing, and then people would drive hundreds of miles along, you know, barren lands to find the leak. So this flow meter technology was able to detect things. Do we have any of that technology today? Do you want me to take this, Jay? You can, see if you know okay. the same thing I do. Okay, well, yeah, so you can correct me. We have flow okay. meters, um, or we're, we're able to measure the flows coming into the lift stations, and that's the primary locate. And then obviously we measure what we pump out of the lift stations. That's our primary location for measuring flows within the system. And then of course we measure the flows that are coming through people's water meters. And during the winter, almost all of that is going into the sewer system. We are actually adding some additional uh, flow monitoring tech uh, meters right now. We're measuring some that will look in some of the gravity systems at um, whether we're getting surcharging or not. We're trying to verify what we're seeing in the in the hydraulic models uh, with more, you know, so we're, we have more trust in the calibration of the hydraulic models. And then we're also getting um, some additional portable monitors. <laughs> flow monitors that we can move around the system to try and track down this elusive I and I to see if we have an area that has got some, especially inflow coming into it. Excellent, uh, that, that's great news to hear that we'll, we'll get some more ability to detect maybe where those inflows are coming from. I know you showed compared to the region, you guys are doing great on I and I. What's like the best in class though, you know, because maybe I don't I don't know, you know, maybe our region is just horrible. Um, what's the what what is sort of with the latest technology, what should one expect the um, you know, the capacity or the, the flows from I and I to be? Is forty to fifty percent of the a system's capacity expected to be taken up by I and I? Is that normal? Jay, what's the county standard? Um, well, the county standard currently is 2,200 gallons per acre per day. It used to be 1,100 gallons per acre per day. 
And um, I believe on the that uh, the map that Jay showed, um, the green was the green area was zero to 1,100 gallons per acre per day. The yellow, the light yellow area was between 1,100 and 3,780 gallons per acre per day. It's a it's a very wide range, but um, the dark red, the worst areas, are. 8,600 to 28,000 gallons per acre per day. So uh, two questions on that. One is how does one translate gallons per acre per day to gallons per minute? Because those are two different measurements. So it, to, to the untrained eye, uh, gallons per acre per day doesn't, I, I can't put that into, you know, the 600, you know, gallons per minute capacity we're talking about here. Um, if you, if you have like an hour, I'll get that for you. <laughs> no worries. Um, <laughs> and, but the question I actually asked was beyond the, the county standard, like what, what is sort of the best in breed? Like the county standard might be horrible, right? Like I know we've done a lot of work in Sammamish to really improve upon the county standards for stormwater management and things like that. So what, what is the industry standard for I and I? is I guess what I'm looking more towards, because that's really where we want to head, right, is, is maybe the county standard's not good enough. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure there's a pure, purely defined industry standard. It's, it's um, determined by local agencies, for instance, um, not to deflect, but I, you know, other agencies, they don't care about I&I, &I, they'll just overflow to surface water. We don't do that. It's absolutely not our goal. And good. So, yeah, so, and, and if you live, let's say, in, uh, um, you know, Arizona, I&I &I isn't a consideration. It, it's, you know, somewhat regional, and it really comes down to what you anticipate your flows to be and what your risk tolerance is, too. Okay, awesome. One last question, um, and that is, uh, you, you talked about the, the delay in the, in the funding for this diversion project. When, when was it planned to be completed? So, or what were you what were you planning? When were you planning on it being completed before well, before you found out the, the so, funding was deferred? So when it was planned to be completed is again subjective because it's moved. It's moved over the years, and so I'm, I'm gonna, before answering that, our, I'm going to tell you that everything that the county does is flow based. So we just had the conversation on flows and measurement of flows and. How do you meter them? Everything the county, every decision they make is flow-based, except when they deprogram the Northern Diversion. We had it, we had it in our comprehensive plan that we anticipated it would be in place no later than 2027. However, 2027? as we went to check okay. in with them, as we went to check in with them in 2018, and Jay religiously has engaged them. When we went to check in and say, hey, where's our project? There was no discussion on flow anymore. It was, your project's not funded. We want, to, we want to incrementally improve your system so that we can avoid our expenditure. So, sure. um, so when you, when you do, you know, your question is a great one because timing is important. Our comp plan does say by 2027, our needs were sooner. Growth occurred quicker in this North Surf Service delivery area um, growth, in fact, between 2011 and 2021, our growth growth occurred 43% quicker than what our comp plan predicted. And that's why you, know, you, you can't pick a point in time. You got to talk about flows. Oh, totally. I, I get that. I just, I was just curious because if, 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 you know, if all things had gone according to plan, it wasn't going to come online until 2027. So at some point we were going to have to do some interim work anyway, right? And I'm not, and I'm not trying to take away from the fact that we still need to push the county hard to get this project uh, funded and to get it moving. But it sounds like at some point as the, as you guys approve, cause it is about flows, right? But as you're approving these certificates and, and monitoring the growth, I guess I was just curious it, it just seemed like it kind of came as a surprise that we hit the capacity. It, it seemed like it happened suddenly, but it wouldn't really happen suddenly, right? We'd be seeing the flow, the, the capacity starting to be 
eaten up. And so I was just curious how we didn't see this coming maybe a little bit sooner. Well, we, you know, the, and your observations are fair. Um, we do have six months of the year that we wouldn't have seen it, at least six months of the year. So it really isn't until the first rain event or first, first significant rain event in 2019 that we saw something and we just didn't know if, if it was an anomaly or if it was something that we would consistently experience. I'm sorry, what was that? That was 2016, you said, when you excuse saw me. that? 2019, excuse me. 2019, December got 20th it. Of 2019, yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate all the information. I really do. And, and thanks for letting me geek out a little bit there on, on some of those numbers. Appreciate it. Okay. Given the time, I will email my question. Does anybody else have any last questions? Um, please feel free to contact Jay or I directly too. We're happy to, you know, if you want to delve deeper in this, happy to share what we know. Okay. I will send mine in. Okay. Thank you so much. Have thank a great you. evening, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have got two proclamations. Uh, we have got the Sexual Assault Awareness Month um, and we have got the Mayor's uh, Monarch Pledge. Um, how about, uh, Deputy Mayor, could you read the Sexual Assault Awareness Month? And um, do we have, how about uh, uh, Council Member Treen, how about the uh, Monarch Pledge? Sure, I'd be happy to. Okay, uh, Sexual Assault Awareness Month for April 2021. Whereas in Washington State, 45% of women and 22% of men report having experienced sexual violence in their lifetime. And whereas in King County, 7,152 adults and children received specialized assistance from organizations with programming for sexual assault victims in 2020. And whereas Rape is among the most underreported crime for reasons that include victims' fears of being disbelieved or further traumatization within system designed to support them. Additional barriers such as language, immigration status, gender bias, and systemic racism further oppress and silence victims. And whereas individual and community impacts of sexual violence are rooted in and compounded by racial, gender, sexual orientation, and other forms of oppression. Black, indigenous, and other people of color, people living in poverty, LGBTQ people, elders, people with disabilities, and other people targeted by oppression are affected by sexual violence in significant and complex ways. And whereas statewide, 29% of the survivors who were reported by community sexual assault organizations identified as black, indigenous, and people of color in 2019. Of those identifying ethnicity, 21% identified as Latinx and Hispanic. Whereas King County is home to many organizations that provide cultural and linguistically specific services for survivors for various racial, ethnic, faith, and cultural communities, survivors who are immigrants and refugees, survivors who are LGBTQ, and survivors with disabilities. These cultural specific services are critical to effectively responding to the specific needs and barriers many survivors face and whereas negative impacts of sexual violence, trauma on women, men, children, and youth include fear, concern for safety, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, injury, and missed work or school, and whereas working together as a community, we can alleviate the trauma of sexual violence by ensuring supportive resources are available to all survivors while standing up to harmful attitudes and behaviors that contribute to sexual assault. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Mayor Karen Moran and the Sammamish City Council join advocates and communities across King County in taking action to prevent sexual violence by standing with survivors and proclaiming April, April 2021 a Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Council Member Treen. Sammamish Washington Proclamation of the Mayor's Monarch Pledge Day. Whereas the monarch butterfly is an iconic North American species whose multi-generational migration and metamorphosis from a caterpillar to a butterfly has captured the imaginations of millions of Americans. 
And whereas both the Western and Eastern monarch populations have seen significant declines with less than 1% of the Western monarch population remaining, while the Eastern population has fallen by as much as 90%. And whereas Sammamish recognizes that human health ultimately depends on well-functioning ecosystems and that biodiversity regions can better support food production, healthy soil and air quality, and can foster healthy connections between humans and wildlife. And whereas cities and towns and counties have a critical role to play to help save the monarch butterfly, and Sammamish is striving to become a leader. And whereas on March 18, 2021, Mayor Karen Moran signed the National Wildlife Federation's Mayor's Monarch Pledge and have officially committed to taking meaningful action to protect the monarch butterfly. And whereas Sammamish is committed to declare a proclamation and notify residents through social media awareness. And whereas every resident of Sammamish can make a difference for the monarch by planting native milkweed, nectar plants, to provide habitat for the monarch and pollinators in locations where people live, work, learn, play, and worship. And whereas Sammamish is committed to launch a public communications effort to encourage residents to plant monarch gardens at home or in their neighborhoods, engage with gardening leaders and partners to support monarch butterfly conservation. And now, therefore, Karen Moran, on behalf of the city council, do hereby proclaim April 6, 2021 as Mayor's Monarch Pledge Day in Sammamish and encourage all residents to participate in community activities that support and celebrate monarch conservation. And if you have a chance, I'll just throw a plug in here, uh, Earth Day on the 22nd, there's uh, some information on the city's website for the tours that are going around. And if you have a chance to check out the Sammamish Stewarts, uh, the Sammamish Stewarts is a volunteer group that has been planting pollinator gardens uh, for the butterflies that are also native here to Washington. Yes, and this is something I remember Thanks. teaching for Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and the fact that the um, monarch is such a, um, so important to the, not only the health of our planet, but to the um, uh, food system. So, yes. yeah, excellent, thank you. Okay, next we have got the uh, public hearing this evening. And so our public hearing, and I know we have one on the line, so we are going to open our public hearing this evening. Our hearing this evening is an ordinance of the city of Sammamish, Washington, relating to the wireless communication facilities and adopting a new Sammamish Municipal Code, Chapter 21A56, in, in wireless communication facilities and adopting wireless facility design standards and repealing uh, Sammamish Municipal Chapter 21A.55, wireless communications facilities and amending Sammamish Municipal Code Section 20.05.020, classifications of land use decision processes, no. amending Sammamish Municipal Code Chapter 21A.15, technical terms and land use definitions, and amending, this is a, whoosh, this is a mouthful, <laughs> amending Sammamish Municipal Code 21A.20.100, table of regional land uses, amending Sammamish Municipal Code 21B.20.100, <laughs> Table of Regional Land Use Uses Providing for Severability and Establishing an Effective Date of 02021-528. And I believe we have Mr. Pyle. Uh, Mr. Yes. Pyle, are you on the line? I am. Good evening, Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, uh, Mayor Moran, members of the council tonight with me, I have uh, the wireless communications facilities uh, team um, that includes uh, Evan Fisher, senior management analyst, uh, Brittany Port from AHBL, Eileen uh, Kiefer from uh, Madrona Law. Um, these uh, individuals have been helping us with our um, proposed changes to our wireless communication facilities code. Um, tonight you have um, three options. Uh, the first option is to open the public hearing um, take comment from the public, consider the comment, close the public hearing, deliberate on it, and possibly adopt it. 
if you do choose to adopt it tonight, there is a partner resolution that goes along with it, which is a, res a, a resolution amending the city's fee ordinance, as we do have to set in place a fee structure for these types of wireless permits that we will be creating with this ordinance. Um, your second option is to open the public hearing, accept public comment, and continue the public hearing to a date certain in the future uh, where you can then close it um, in the event that you felt like there was additional time needed. Um, the third option, finally, is uh, to choose to postpone the public hearing if you felt like there was a uh, cause to do so and, this, and give staff further direction, in which case we would then bring it back at a later date. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Brittany uh, from HBL, um, one of our, our primary consultants working on this. We'll give you a brief presentation, and then we can proceed with the public hearing if, if, if appropriate. Thank you. All right. Thank you, David. I'm hoping you guys are seeing my screen now. Um, my name is Brittany Port. I'm a land use planner at HBL, and as David mentioned, we have been assisting the city with the adoption of a new wireless communication facilities code. Uh, so tonight, um, in advance of the public hearing, I'm just going to go through um, kind of a brief summary of the project and the proposed amendments um, you know, for the benefit of the, the city council as well as the public. I know we uh, held a briefing on this on March 2nd, um, so I know you, you have some familiarity with it. But then I will also be available to answer um, any lingering questions you might have um, and then uh, you know, uh, proceed with the public hearing. Um, so first, going to go through the city's current regulations and talk about how the city currently regulates wireless communication facilities, then talk about why the, the code is changing and what prompted the changes to the wireless communication facilities code, um, give a brief overview of the code amendment process, and then an overview of the proposed amendments, and I'm going to walk through the new permitting process uh, that will be applicable to wireless communication facilities in the city of Sammamish, um, and then talk about some of those additional code amendment sections um, that will need to be amended in the Sammamish Municipal Code to help facilitate this. So first, I'm um, just going to briefly talk about how the city's existing current regulations were adopted in 2010 and then further um, amended in 2012 and 2016. Um, but this code was developed to respond to the technology that was in place at that time, which primarily consisted of cell towers and antennas that cover a large area. These macro facilities or monopoles are still going to be the backbone of the city's wireless network. Um, the city will still likely be seeing some permits for macro facilities as the service providers continue to build out their network in the city. However, the technology is evolving such that the city is seeing requests for small cells. Small cells um, consist of antennas that operate at a low frequency and are designed to have a shorter range, so they might only have a coverage area of 500 to 1,000 feet. Uh, small cells serve to densify the existing wireless network and will be the basis for the deployment of 5G. Typically, small cells are attached to utility poles or light or traffic poles within rights of way. Um, they consist of an antenna that is generally three cubic feet in size or smaller, and they're placed uh, generally 25 to 45 feet in height rather than um, those tall macro towers that you see that extend um, 75 feet or, or higher in height. So why is the code changing? Um, the city's wireless regulations do not currently address small cells, and as such, the city is in need of updating it in order to permit these facilities. Additionally, the Federal Communications Commission has issued several declaratory orders to streamline the, the deployment of 5G, uh, 4G and 5G wireless service. The orders have limited fees that could be charged with respect to small wireless facilities locating on city-owned infrastructure or in the right-of-way. They've also established guidelines for the imposition of aesthetic standards um, on small wireless facilities, and they provided permitting de deadlines um, or shot clocks for communities to permit new wireless facilities. Um, so the code needs to be updated to um, address those um, items in the FCC's order. And then last, many providers are not uh, investing or upgrading their technology because the existing code um, as it stands does not allow for this technology, and they know that new technology is coming. Um, the city hasn't made aware of the challenges that the community is facing with internet connectivity due to COVID, and amending the code will facilitate the deployment of the infrastructure necessary to support the growing demands on the city's wireless network. 
The city has been working on revisions to its wireless communication facilities code since the summer of 2019. Uh, initially, the code was developed by reviewing other wireless codes from neighboring jurisdictions and taking best practices or favorite elements and building a code that works for the city. Um, and then during the summer of 2019, the public was engaged in the process through a booth at the weekly farmer's market and a web page on Connect Sinamish. Um, the wireless industry was also engaged and provided the draft code for their comments as well. Uh, and then the Planning Commission was briefed on the draft code at four work sessions um, between the fall of 2019 and uh, early 2020, and then held a public hearing on the amendments on, um, in February of 2020. The chapter was originally set to go to the City Council in April, but um, due to the COVID-19 outbreak, it was put on pause and pushed to the fall of 2020. Um, during that, that break in the legislative review, the project team did identify that additional changes to the code were needed. Um, the changes that were made were generally to increase, um, to provide for increased uh, and fast, uh, to ex expedite the uh, fast and reliable internet um, that the city has been needing uh, and reduce staff processing uh, time and make this code just generally more efficient for permitting. Um, those changes were summarized to the Planning Commission um, between October and January of uh, 20, or October and November of 2020, and then in December and January of 2021, the Planning Commission held another public hearing on the code amendment, um, uh, heard public comment, and then voted to recommend approval of the SNC 21A56 that has been presented by staff and amended by the Planning Commission that you're seeing tonight. Um, and then on March 2nd, uh, 2021, as mentioned, uh, the City Council was briefed on the amendments to the wireless code, which brings us um, here to tonight's public hearing. The proposed regulations are contained in um, Exhibit 1, but uh, very generally, the new code provides regulations for small cell wireless facilities, which were not previously addressed. Um, the, the code clarifies where wireless communication facilities can be located pursuant to a table of uses in SMC 21A56070, which aligns with the city's zoning ordinance and makes clear where wireless communication facilities are permitted within the city. Um, requirements for the design and location of wireless communication facilities are included for small cell wireless facilities in SMC 21A56100 and macro cell wireless facilities in SMC 21A56110. And then the city has also opted to include design guidelines, which are adopted by reference um, and provide the city more control over the design and aesthetics of wireless communications facilities. So um, uh, controlling over um, paint color, concealment techniques, um, providing for screening and landscaping of wireless communication facilities. With the adoption of this code, the city will have several new permitting procedures that have been developed to streamline permitting for facilities that align with the city's code and develop and design guidelines. Um, so the first, I'm gonna go through those um, are exemptions. Um, certain wireless communication facility uses will be exempt from the permitting requirements of the chapter, and those include eligible facility requests, um, which are requests for modification of an existing tower or base station that does not substantially change the physical dimension of the tower or base station. These are typically um, replacement of transmission equipment, such as swapping an antenna kind of like for like for another. Um, it also includes uh, small satellite dish and television antennas, uh, emergency communications equipment, and amateur radio towers. So these were exemptions that were previously in the city's code that have been carried over. Um, and then for small cell wireless facilities, um, those that are permitted and located in permitted uh, locations within the city um, may be permitted with an expedited wireless use permit. Um, so this would be a permit that the city can use um, when a uh, wireless, a small cell wireless facility is located in a permitted area and it meets all of the general requirements as well as the city's design guidelines. Um, this would allow the city to be able to issue a permit um, knowing that the, the facility conforms to the city's code and they're not asking for any deviations. Um, so they'll be able to, to do that in a, in a quicker fashion. Um, this might include a pictured on um, the picture on the left a small cell wireless facility that's located on an existing support structure, such as a utility pole, um, or it could also include a small cell wireless facility that's on a new pole but is in one of the city's commercial zones. Small cell wireless facilities that are permitted, um, that are permitted uses in the zoning district but require a minor deviation from the wireless facility design standards may be permitted with a standard wireless use permit. Um, a minor deviation in this case would include deviations to the dimensions, the height or volume that is required to conform to the requirements of the poll owner, provide adequate safety clearances or address similar technical issues. 
And then last, small cell wireless facilities that are conditionally permitted uses or trigger SEPA review may be permitted with a conditional use permit. Um, so this would include small cell wireless facilities that are located on a new support structure in a residential zone, such as the picture to the right, um, or again, for, for those that, that um, exceed the exemptions under SEPA. The conditional use permit application requires the applicant demonstrate through technical analysis that, if, that the facility would not meet network objectives based on the siting criteria, um, or that it's technically infeasible to meet the city's design standards. If technical documentation is required, the city may engage a consultant to peer review the technical analysis. Um, for macro cell facilities, there are two permitting paths. Um, the first is for those that are located, um, that are identified as permitted uses in the zoning district. They may, permit, may be permitted with the standard wireless use permit. Um, macro cell wireless facilities that are not that are uh, that are not permitted uses or are conditionally permitted uses um, may be permitted with a conditional use permit. So this would be those that cannot be cited with a standard wireless use permit or are identified as conditionally permitted uses in the zone. Um, this also requires the applicant demonstrate that the siting um, that, that they've considered siting in a permitted location, but it would not meet the network objectives, um, or that um, also that co-location is infeasible and provide technical analysis to, to support the conditional use permit request. Um, and similarly, if that technical documentation is submitted, the city may engage a third-party consultant to review the accuracy of the technical information. Um, to wrap up, I'm going to um, also note some of those uh, code cleanup items that uh, were mentioned. The city will be amending a few additional sections of the Sammamish Municipal Code um, to help facilitate the uh, repeal and replacement of SMC 21A55 with SMC 21A56. Um, so the first will be uh, repealing certain definitions in 21A15 that per pertain to wireless communication facilities. Um, as a section in SMC 21A56 has been included that contains um, all of the uh, wireless communication facilities definition. We will also be amending the, the table of uses in SMC 21A2100 and 21B2100. Um, these will direct users to SMC 21A56 for the um, permitted and conditionally permitted wireless communication facility uses. And um, the new permitting processes for wireless communication facility exemptions, expedited wireless use permits, and standard wireless use permits have been incorporated into SMC 2005-020 as type one decision. Um, so with that, um, I am available for questions um, before you get into the deliberation. Okay, first we have got, um, I do believe we have got a, a caller We've got two callers that are on the line. Uh, Mayor uh, David Pyle, do you, do you yes. want to open the public hearing? I already did that. Oh, great. Yes, I did that at the beginning. Did you not hear my, okay. I'll... I did not, I apologize. Okay, so we have got two callers on the line and let's, let's get to them first because they've been holding for quite a while. Mike. Okay. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, similar to our public comment rounds, uh, we'll have three minutes for uh, public comment on the public hearing. Again, 15 seconds before your three minutes is complete, I'll provide a time warning, and at three minutes you'll be muted. And please start your comment by stating your name and the city you live in for the record. Uh, and I'll go ahead and unmute our first caller, who I believe is Ms. Wichter. Uh, caller, you are unmuted and you have three minutes. Hi, my name is Mary Wichter and I've lived in Sammamish for 20 years. And I would like to say there's been an awful lot of work that city staff, consultants, and thought that has been put into the wireless code. Um, it's come around a number of times. The Planning Commission has worked on it a lot. Even after they did changes, they kind of read through the fine tooth comb and did more changes. And I think that the usefulness and the capabilities of the code are much more important and useful to the city if they would be adopted than if they would be delayed any more longer or not adopted. And in the event that there might be something that's fully not included or needs to get changed, I believe small changes can be made. So I would encourage the City Council to consider um, these uh, seriously and adopt them if possible tonight with the fee structure that Director Pyle had talked about. 
Um, I do also think with COVID-19, um, with unprecedented uh, pandemic, a lot of people are working from home. Connectivity is super important. You have kids doing things from home, and we just need more connectivity, and I only see that um, doing this code would help everything. And then, as I've spoken in the past, um, I did not send in PowerPoint or slides or photos tonight. There were a, a, a pair of ospreys that were um, nesting on top of a macro cell tower near the park and ride by Pine Lake. Um, they had been seen there for two years with offspring and juveniles. Um, that nest was noticed last December that it had been taken down. I do understand through my research that ospreys tend to mate for life and they tend to use the same nests over again. So I don't know what they've done since it's spring and it's their soon to be nesting time, but I can tell you that I've noticed um, more birds of prey, including eagles who usually nest lower and ospreys who like to nest at the top. Um, they, I think with all the activity going in Marymore, we're starting to see more in our city. So I'd like to have more open places um, for these. I don't know in this code if the pole height could be extended so you could have a higher nest so it's safer for the birds. And if anybody's going to remove a nest, that they would just at least inform the city of the intention and schedule and that perhaps the materials could be reserved for kids or scouts or students or the parks department might be able to put up another pole with the osprey nest. And I know that it could be done during wildlife code, but your critical areas of code isn't happening until 2024. So I would ask that if you can't do anything in this code tonight, um, that you would definitely say that council would like to see it in either the urban forestry management plan or in development regulations phase two, which are both at planning convention and coming to council this year. So thanks for listening to me again. I don't have any of the photos tonight, but I've been speaking to those again. And I just wanted to thank everybody, including David Pyle, who as director has been doing a lot of code reading and said seconds. we can actually do spot coding for wildlife networks and corridors and thank you for the monarch butterfly uh, proclamation tonight as well thank you mary moving on to our second and final caller this evening uh, caller number two you have three minutes Good evening, this is Gregory Bush with Wireless Policy Group here tonight on behalf of AT&T. Uh, it's Wireless Policy Group's offices are in Issaquah, Washington. I'd like to thank the council for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, as we're all aware, wireless communications are an increasingly important part of how we live our day-to-day -day lives. AT&T's priority is to provide stable, consistent connections to customers, and we are constantly assessing and upgrading our network to respond to the tremendous increase in demand for mobile data. While AT&T does not agree with everything in the proposed code update, we would like to thank the city of Sammamish for its leadership in updating its code to keep pace with the latest technology. AT&T looks forward to improving service to Sammamish residents, businesses, and first responders. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Okay, that, um, uh, that is our public calls in for the hearing this evening. So that leads us to council. This is just for questions, not for debates. So uh, Deputy Mayor. Thanks. Um, first, I, I do want to say thank you both to our staff um, and as well as the Planning Commission who have obviously touched this a lot. Um, so I appreciate them um, taking the lion's share of the work on this um, and kind of uh, neatly handing it to Council with a bow on top. Um, I do have a question, though, and it, it stems from uh, not it doesn't stem from Mary's comments, but it's uh, I guess dovetails nicely with her comments on on nesting facilities. One of the things that's in the updated language relative to nests is something about the macro facilities, and that we are trying to discourage nests from the macro facilities. And I just was curious as to why is there some danger to the birds? Is there some danger to the macro facility? Why are we discouraging them there? So, uh, David Pyle, I'd, I'd be happy to take that one. Um, so, uh, first of all, just to be clear, the, the optional code language included as uh, Exhibit 7 is something that the City Council could choose to add to the, the ordinance tonight. Um, it is not currently included in the draft ordinance. Um, if the Council saw fit, those are some optional items that could be added. 
um, if the council does not take action on on adding it, it will not be included with the ordinance. Um, to answer the question directly, um, we we um, feel like you know a, a, a wireless facility where um, there's a certain power on the antennas, so a macro facility, um, is probably not the most appropriate place for uh, wildlife to be located, given that in order for humans to service those facilities, they first have to depower them. Um, and human um, in, activity is, is restricted within a certain distance due to the power of those, those facilities at that location. So um, our, our sense on this is is that it might not be appropriate for wildlife to be using a facility that has to first be depowered prior to humans servicing it. And that's fair. I was just kind of curious as to why we were strategically discouraging, constructing them as to discourage. I'm assuming that means little spikes would be coming up as to discourage and thus building. And that's fine. I was just kind of curious about it. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Council Member Odell. Oh. Okay, Mike is on now. Can you hear me? Can you yes. hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. I was kind of muted. Couldn't, couldn't get it unmuted. I have uh, actually about three questions. Uh, first of all, how many of these new type of uh, uh, facilities will be in the city limits? So that's that's one that this is David Pyle, uh, Community Development. That that is one that that we cannot answer at this point in time. Um, if if we were to do simply an, an assessment of um, how many would be located in a, a certain distance, um, we we would then look to the spacing. Um, allowances for the the, the uh, small cell facilities. Um, I would I would uh, ask if uh, Brittany or Evan or Eileen um, can recall what the spacing is in the code. Admittedly, I haven't looked at it in a short period here, so I can't recall. Um, but ba that is based on spacing, and what you'll find is that these facilities might be ki kind of like uh, light poles um, in their spacing. So you'd probably see them pop up about that frequency. Uh, Evan or, or uh, Brittany, I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, I believe the spacing is um, 350 feet in the city's code. Um, obviously, the providers, you know, they are going to have their own spacing requirements based off of their um, uh, technical design of their antennas. Um, and then just kind of uh, generally the um, probably first area that you'll see them in are going to be areas where you have more dense development, such as your town center, where you have multifamily development because of where they're seeing um, an increased need for the densification of their wireless network. Um, as it gets out to, say, residential areas in, in the city, um, it, it may be less less frequent in, in spacing as, um, you know, they they don't need to space them as closely to create that dense network like they would in a, a, an area where you have commercial um, or you know uh, high density residential um, neighborhoods that they're trying to serve. Um, so it's going to going to really vary depending on their technical needs. But then the city's code does require that they are a minimum of 350 feet apart. Okay, I'm probably the only person on the council and maybe even staff that was around for the first last time we did this. And it caused a, caused a lot of, uh, shall we say, consternation within the community. There are issues concerning uh, electromagnetic interference, uh, visual impact, et cetera. Uh, let me take those in order. Uh, were there any, are there any issues in electromagnetic interference that we need to talk about? Um, no, uh, sorry, David, I don't know if you want to jump in. Go ahead, but, um, just generally the city, um, cannot regulate based off of the electromagnetic, um, the, the radio frequencies that they're operating at. Those are, um, uh, those are dictated by the Federal Communications Commission when they're issuing um, spectrum for these uh, facilities and reviewing the facilities. So um, it can't be something that the city includes in, in the regulation. So we cannot touch that because it's federal, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> 
The second question is along the same lines. Uh, are there, uh, it sounds like in certain areas at least we can have about one every block, is that right? Yes, yeah, they could be every block. Um, yeah, they, they could be as long as they're 350 feet apart. So are we going to see a major improvement in service level? I mean, where I am, I get one bar if I'm lucky. Yeah, um, so what you'll generally see is um, probably faster um, data speed, but they can also um, help with the, um, uh, if you're making um, cell phone calls as well. So yes, um, yeah, you should see an improvement in your service if you have a small cell that's within a couple hundred feet from you. Okay, will we see an increase in the micro polls? Um, there may be additional macro polls that are um, developed in the city. Um, you know, City of Sammamish has a lot of, you have a lot of rolling topography, a lot of very tall trees, um, and some of the wireless providers are still working out, um, working on building out their, their actual network coverage. Um, and so they may be building new macro polls to um, kind of uh, build out the rest of their network, whereas the, the small cells are really to boost the existing network. Um, so you, you still might see, and you probably will see macro polls. Well, I'm sure we'll see them because I don't think they're going away. I just wondered if we were looking at a significant increase in the number of them. Um, I would say most of the providers are focused on um, the small cells at this point. Um, they will probably still be still be you know doing a couple macro polls if, if it's needed, but generally think to get um, to the 5G service that they're advertising, they're, um, they're really focused on putting small cells in. Okay, and lastly, are these polls being shared by all carriers or the unique to each carrier? Um, that's a great question. So uh, unlike macro cell facilities where we can have co-location um, with multiple providers um, co-locating their antennas on one tower, um, small cells are generally not going to allow for co-location because of the um, space and volume requirements and that they need to be at that um, um, certain height, could be 25 to, to 45 feet above um, street level to be able to achieve the kind of like cone of, of a um, coverage that they um, uh, that they rely on because they rely on line of sight coverage. Um, so there's generally not enough room on a pole for more than one small cell. And um, in the case of uh, when a provider installs a wireless only pole or if they're replacing a um, city light standard with an integrated um, small cell, they're generally outfitting the, the tower to include all of the technology um, within that tower. And it, there's generally not a place for um, additional equipment to be housed in it because it's, you know, you're dealing with a really small um, diameter um, of space that they, that they can put all of that equipment into. Um, so no, unfortunately, the small cells will generally just be for one provider at this time. So this could lead to a proliferation of poles. Yes, which which is um, why the city has put in the spacing requirements in the code to help um, mitigate that um, proliferation within the city. Okay, I have no further questions at this time. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Ross. Thank you. With the 350 feet spacing I heard, is that taking account trying to optimize performance, considering any health recommendations or both? Um, so the 350 feet was um, uh, trying to um, control the city's right of way and make sure that there's still room within the right of way for other amenities um, and uh, utilities that you want to locate in your right of way. Um, so, you know, the city recognizes that the right of way is, you know, a precious resource and wants to be able to, um, you know, make sure that there are, just, there are the other amenities that you would typically find in, in the right of way um, that are able to be there. And it's not just, you know, um, small cell poles. Um, the, um, you know, the spacing requirements, I think, were generally looked at as, you know, that would be a typical 
um, block length um, allows for that um, within that range of the 500 to 1,000 feet that they're, um, they, they typically need. Um, and uh, the health issues are generally not addressed by the city because, as mentioned, the FCC kind of covers all of that um, with their um, uh, issuance of, of spectrum to the providers. Chris, did you have any, you. Other, any other questions? No, no, thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna actually pass on mine for the moment. So Council Member Gamblin. Yeah, um, thanks for the information, this is great. Um, I, I know we've been asking questions on spacing, but so the 350 foot spacing, let's say there's four cell companies that wanna operate within the city of Sammamish. Does that mean, and they each have their own cell towers because they're not sharing. So does that mean if we had four, let's just say four, it could be five, it could be three, it could be six. Does that mean within that 350 foot spacing that all each of those companies would have a um, micro tower? So in other words, there'd be in this example, there'd be four micro towers within that 350 foot space, one for each company. I believe the way the code reads is that the 350 feet is just from any existing small cell facility. So that would include one that um, is owned by a different provider. I'm not sure I understood the answer. So again, let's let's just, let's just say for discussion, there's four separate um, cell companies looking to operate within the city. And each of them is going to need their own micro towers because they don't share these towers. And each of them needs it within a certain distance. Again, you guys put, put out 350 feet. So if that's the case, would there be one cell tower, micro cell tower within each 350 feet? Or would there be four or five or three, depending on the companies, let's say four, would there be four cell towers, one for each company that wanted to provide service? within that 350 feet. So, so Brittany, I can, I can jump in here. Item uh, G, it's gonna be located in the code. It's section 21A, the proposed section 21A.56.100, item one G, where it says, a new small wireless facility pole may not be sited within 350 feet of an existing small wireless facility pole owned, operated, or utilized by the same wireless service provider without a conditional use permit. In no event shall new small wireless facility poles be placed 150 feet from existing small wireless facility poles, regardless of whether such poles are owned, operated, or utilized by the same provider. So to answer your question, the spacing can be no closer than 150 feet from any pole, regardless of ownership or operation. However, a provider may place one pole every 350 feet if that street does not currently have any poles on it. Um, so I, I hope that helps clarify for you. There, there could be quite a proliferation because you could see these poles popping up every 150 feet and, and, and hopscotching or you know alternating providers, um, which which could provide or, or result in being uh, you know uh, uh, quite a build out. Now this topic came up and was discussed at length on multiple occasions by the Planning Commission, um, and there was extensive feedback provided by the wireless industry, um, and the wireless industry indicated that any spacing beyond what we're requiring is something that is unworkable to them. Um, and I'll let uh, Eileen chime in. We're, we're, we're sort of in this, this predicament here where um, the FCC and federal rule is dictating to us what we can and cannot do. And, and we're, we're skirting the edge of that here with our design requirements, trying not to, to render the city's potential rules unworkable or um, at odds with the FCC. And at the same time, 
protect the city from blight or unintended consequences due to um, excessive proliferation of these types of facilities. So we, we tried to find that tipping point, that balance of what, what is appropriate in order for the system to still be functional. Eileen, I don't know if you have anything more to say to that. Thanks, David, and uh, good evening, Mayor, good evening, Council and City Manager. Uh, my name is Eileen Kiefer. I'm with Madrona Law Group. Um, I'm very pleased to be working on this with staff. Um, the, the spacing requirements, I'll note um, that in addition to what David has pointed out, uh, that not all small wireless facilities will require a new pole or a new structure. Um, as Brittany said, some of these could be located on existing utility poles, so on existing PSE poles, uh, light standards, other structures that are already existing. Um, and the code actually encourages providers to use existing structures. Those are generally eligible for a, an expedited wireless use permit, um, as long as they comply with the city's design standards. So in this way, the city is, between that and the spacing requirements, um, the city was trying to uh, avoid a pole proliferation. Uh, by both encouraging use of existing structures and then um, uh, using a spacing spacing requirement to the extent permissible by law. So, Eileen, I understand that, and thank you for that. I guess my bigger question is how much are we tilting at wind, windmills here? Because ultimately, much of this is mandated by the FCC. We're trying to put our, I guess, our flyer on it, you could say. But um, if a provider comes along, and they want to put their pole in, and it's within a certain distance that we, it's closer than 150 feet, but it's the only way their system can be viable. Are they not going to be supported by the FCC? And they're going to basically say, listen, they have the right to do that, uh, despite what your code says, and they're going to be able to go ahead and put that in. I am trying to think of whether or not, and David, you can help me out here as to whether or not they could be eligible for either a uh, conditional, use, conditional permit. use permit or a variance. Uh, one thing that we've done throughout the code is put in what I call safety hatches um, of, you know, we're going to try to get folks to do things the way we want to see them done, but if they have a technical need, then typically you're just subject to, you know, a, greater scrutiny and perhaps a longer permitting path um, and perhaps uh, subject to third-party review. But David, the FCC you want to wants, in? Yeah, I'm sorry, Eileen. Um, the FCC wants this. Um, they're backing up the providers. We're trying to, to have some order for the city. But if push comes to shove and a provider comes in and says to be viable um, and for our system to work, we need polls here, here, and here, Despite what our code says, and maybe with a little bit of delay, they're going to go to the FCC, and the FCC is going to say, yeah, you get your polls where you want. Is that correct? So that would really be, I mean, the FCC promulgates rules and, uh, and regulations. It, ultimately, it would be up to a, a court to decide whether or not the city was in line with those FCC regulations. And we've really designed this code to be compliant with the current federal law and current federal regulations. So, you know, we've brought you a code that we think is defensible. Okay. Well, again, not meaning to argue, but it's defensible to the point that we're saying what we want, and then you guys say, but if the provider comes back and says, well, that doesn't work for us because our system's not viable, it doesn't seem we have a lot of um, ammunition to say no um, if they push hard because that's what they want. So we, so we have we, with that. We've built in two, two mechanisms into the code. As Eileen said, there's safety hatches, um, release valves. And in addition to that, we've also, also built in the ability for us to engage a third party consultant, qualified consultant to assist in rebutting what a uh, provider might be saying. So if they're saying for technical reasons, we need to put these poles 100 feet apart and we're, you know, we're going to go through the conditional use permit process, city, but you have to give us that, that permit. M maybe we dress them up to look differently or maybe they're limited in their height or something, right? That's a conditional, th those are the conditions that are placed through conditional use process. 
we can push back and say, hey, we don't agree with your technical rationale for that. We've had our consultant review it. You have to place them 150 feet apart. And I think what, what Councilmember Gamblin is saying here is that when push comes to shove, if that goes to court, the, the uh, provider could possibly prevail. But they would have to have technical reason beyond what they showed our third party at, to justify why that's necessary for the court to rule in their favor. And that, that's sort of how we've designed this is that, you know, they, they can come in and say, oh, it has to be 100 feet apart for X, Y, and Z. And we could say, oh, well, we don't, we, we don't uh, agree with that. Tell us technically why it's necessary. They could provide that technical information. We would then use the third party um, to review that. And if our third party agrees and says, yes, you know, we, we agree with their, their technical analysis and their, their rationale for the 100-foot spacing, then we would let them proceed through conditional use permit process and apply some additional design features to it. But if, but if our technical um, consultant comes back and says, no, we disagree, their, 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 uh, pro their technical rationale doesn't hold up, then we would say no. We, we, we've denied your permit, and then it would go to court. Okay. Well, I'll leave it at 350 feet for providers. We've already said 350 works. There's four providers. We could get a pole every 87 and a half feet because that's what our code says they're allowed to do. So. I, I do also just want to note, just if it gives you guys any any bit of um, comfort here, that we've seen with other with other clients that I represent, typically the the providers have kind of gotten out of litigation mode, and especially with the small cells, they're willing to engage the community. Uh, we've seen providers in other cities do walks with the neighbors because perhaps they don't want a small cell facility on you know, this side of the block, but the other side of the block might be okay, or they might want it on the corner as opposed to the middle of the block. So these types of um, tweaks are something that we've certainly seen the industry actually do when they're, when they're on the ground fighting these small cell facilities. You got it. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you, David. Um, okay, I'm going to go back and I'm going to ask my question since we, we brought up tweaking. Um, back back in the day when I was on the planning commission, and this was actually um, was one of the things that we covered, and um, we spent an aw awful lot of time <laughs> talking about how to disguise these poles. Mm -hmm. um, because it was a big deal to the public um, not to make them or not to have them look how they look. So um, as you say, uh, you know, they may not want one or they, it may be better if it were, you know, you could tweak and have it be across the street. Well, one of the other things is it would be better if it didn't look the way it looked. Um, so we spent a lot of time um, getting input from different cities of, of um, you know, uh, having standards of how it looks. So that was one of the things I was looking for here and um, I did not see it. So um, I'm looking for a little input from um, David. Maybe you can tell me kind of where that is. I would uh, defer to Brittany here. I don't know if you can indicate where that would be located. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, what you might be looking for are the wireless facility design standards, which are contained in attachment B. Um, we we don't have uh, one standard uh, design or way that the small cells are going to look. Um, you know, like you might uh, require um, in some communities uh, a macro tower to be designed as a saguaro um, uh, cacti or a pine tree. Um, the reason, uh, you know, kind of for that in looking at this with um, the providers is that oftentimes the concealment techniques just make the facilities more prominent. And where they're generally wanting to locate are on um, utility poles where you have, um, you know, wires and cables that are already up there, um, uh, boxes for the cable network. Um, so generally, you know, they, they, they don't stand out as much as, as you might, um, you know, kind of imagine that they would. 
Um, and then in the case of um, replacement um, holes, um, there is a, um, a, a desire for those to be um, uh, to, to conform to the city's existing standards. I'm trying to look and where that's contained into the code. So if the city had an existing light standard where they were um, proposing to replace, they wanted to replace that light standard and integrate a small cell into it, they would design that light standard to conform to the city's adopted light standard um, for that area. Um, just generally, um, you know, we do encourage them through the wireless facility design standards because they, they are required to meet these in order to get the expedited permitting um, to camouflage their um, equipment, to paint it so it, um, so it looks like, uh, say, a, a utility pole um, or to just blend into the surrounding area. Um, and so, you know, some of those standards, those are contained in the wireless um, facility design standards. And then just as well as through the, the way that we're trying to permit these, which is trying to encourage that they are placed on existing poles, which are generally light poles in an area where um, it's not going to stick out as much. Okay, because um, my concern was without seeing it here and having it, um, you know, in writing and, and in the code and having it referenced and is that um, we were not going to see it. And it was, it was very loud and clear from the public then, um, which was that they just did not want to see regular polls. That was to them, that was very secondary. Um, they wanted to see that, they wanted to see more of the trees, especially if we were going to have a tree canopy, then if it was going to be around trees, that it be a tree. If it was going to be, and and I know you say they stick out more, but I am um, I can tell you from um, being more alerted to them, and now whenever I go someplace, I actually look for them. So my last trip being in um, Palm Springs, they did a magnificent job with making them palm trees. And um, so it was, to me, it's really, um, I think they, they do some wonderful stuff um, with them. So um, I have, to me, I think that is something that should be looked at and it should be in there. But that's, that's my so, opinion. So, so uh, Mayor, Mayor Moran, um, we, we do have included with um, Exhibit 1, the draft ordinance, we have Attachment B, which is the uh, wireless facility design standards. And within the wireless facility design standards, you'll find all of the uh, technical requirements related to um, how a wireless facility should look and feel and where it should be placed. Um, that that we, we felt that creating a set of wireless design facility standards was a better option than directly integrating it into the code because it's still enforceable by code. But at the same time, it is easier to update as technology changes. Um, so we, we felt like like this was a, a an easier, um, I, I guess, future task if we wanted to upgrade, up, update these to reflect changes in technology. We've seen changes in technology just since this project started in 2019. Um, and one of the things we also learned, and Eileen can, can back me up on this, is that um, we, we cannot dictate to the wireless service providers um, what type of materials they should be using. We cannot dictate the type of antenna they should be using. We cannot dictate um, within reason the, the exact size that it should be. We, we can dictate how it should look and feel generally, um, but we, we can't get down to that level of detail because all of the different providers are using different technologies. They have different frequencies, different antenna types, different equipment types. Um, and because of that, it, it varies widely. So what we're trying to do is to minimize the aesthetic impact of the community and bring it into a, a range of tolerance so that what you're going to see out there is not so widely varying. Um, and we're working within, again, what we feel is our legal legal boundary to do so. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, Council Member Odell. Oh, Karen, I I'm think sorry. I'm we got to pop back up. Sorry. We got to pop back up and get <laughs> Deputy Mayor. Sorry. No worries. Um, so thanks. I, I do have a couple of, of other questions and, and comments. First is I think um, the mayor brought up 
the macro facilities, which I've seen in several of those as well, Karen, um, and they are they are nice. I think a lot of what we're going to see, and based on Councilmember O'Dell's original questions, I think the more likely facilities that we're going to see with this is the small cell wireless rather than the macro facilities, which they can disguise as palm trees. The small cell wireless are going to be more obscure by nature, but unfortunately, they are going to be um, far more prolific in nature. And I think, um, you know, to that end, I, I really appreciate how much time and effort and thought that everyone has put into bringing this forward to council. There's no there's no ideal here, that's for sure. I mean, I know our residents don't want to be staring at small poles out of their front door in their neighborhood, um, but unfortunately, we are bound to um, allow these small cell um, facilities within our community. But I did have a question um, based on what was stated relative to, you know, neighbors being engaged with the providers on certain placement to, you know, within a, at least a some degree. What notification will our neighbors get that, hey, um, you know, XYZ company is considering putting a tower in front of your neighborhood. How is a neighbor actually going to be able to engage with a provider and say, or a neighborhood and say, hey, could you consider maybe putting it, you know, a hundred or, you know, 10 feet this way as opposed to over here? How are they going to be able to do that? I mean, that sounds, you know, like a great idea. I'm just curious how that would actually come to pair. Yeah, so um, for the small cells, um, we do not have a notice requirement for those that are expedited or um, going under the standard wireless use permit process. Um, uh, the reason being for that is um, that those are ones that are going to be either on an existing tower um, or, or pole, um, or they're going to be um, maybe a new pole, uh, but it's in a commercial district. Um, however, we are requiring them to provide a construction notice when they are um, going to be working in the right of way. So there will be notice that one is going in. Um, there's just not uh, an opportunity to comment on it um, because it is a type one decision that um, uh, is administratively uh, decided on. Now for conditional sure. use permits, we are requiring them to provide written notification um, uh, to all immediately adjoining property owners um, and so that way, if it's going to be cited in a residential district, they would get notice. Okay. Okay. And then is there an opportunity to comment then on the conditional use permits? There is. David, yes, David's nodding his head. Okay, perfect. I, okay, that answers my question on how, you know, someone might engage with um, a provider here. Um, one other... Um, but Go ahead. Before, Please. But I don't mean to interrupt, but I, um, I, I also wanted to take this opportunity to bring up one more feature, to highlight an additional feature of this code. And I don't know, Brittany, if you can speak to um, the requirement that providers obtain a franchise agreement with the city and how that works um, with different types. Um, I, I know that um, it, it's a good opportunity for the city council to engage with the provider when a franchise agreement is proposed and under review, and it helps iron out some of the terms as to how these will be deployed in the city. Yeah, great so, point. Um, so for any of these um, facilities that are gonna be located within the city's right of way, um, the city requires a franchise agreement for any um, utility purveyor that's in the right of way. So that would be the same thing for the wireless providers. Um, a lot of times what um, will happen with those um, franchise agreements is that they will um, include designs of their facilities. And so that is an opportunity for the city council um, to have some say in the look and feel of those if they're placed in the right of way. And it's also opportunity for the community to be involved in, in understanding that this is coming their way in the future and that that would be an opportunity for them to provide comment to the council about some refinement or some additional detail in the franchise agreement that they would want to see added regarding, say, placement in the right-of-way. And that would be the opportunity for the council to add that additional refinement. Okay, that's good. I, I assume that, well, I'm not aware of us having a franchise agreement with any of these small cell wireless providers, do we? We have a franchise agreement with Verizon currently for the placement of fiber, but not for the installation of small cell facilities. 
So Verizon is one of the only providers that I'm aware of that is actively out there plumbing the city with fiber in anticipation of rollout of a small cell network. Okay, that's that's helpful to understand. Okay, so Madam Mayor, if I may, um, I'd like to make a motion to one, move to close the public hearing and to adopt chapter 21A.56 of the Sammamish Municipal, Municipal Code as recommended by the Planning Commission. And I'd like to add the addition of Exhibit 7, which is the WCF Habitat Code Changes. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion on the floor and a second uh, discussion. Can I speak to it really quick? Yes. Aside from what I've already said, there's one additional thing that I wanted to address because I know the council has received a couple of emails um, from people that are worried about potential health risks from 5G. One of those emails um, stated that they had gotten information from the World Health Organization. So I went to the World Health Organization website and pulled this information and I am quoting. Um, the topic is, what are the potential health risks from 5G? And it says, to date and after must much research performed, no adverse health effects has been causally linked with the exposure to wireless technologies. Health-related conclusions are drawn from studies performed across the entire radio spectrum, but so far, only a few studies have carried out at the frequency to be used by 5G. Tissue heating is the main mechanism of interaction between radio frequency fields and the human body. Radio frequency exposure levels from current technologies result in negligible temperature rise in the human body. It goes on, but you can look it up um, on the World Health Organization website as well. So, Okay, thank you. Is there any other comments from council members? Uh, I see Councilmember Ross, I think yours just came in, possibly. Yep. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mayor. To be clear, this vote is not to the city to authorize 5G in our community. What we're doing is trying to manage the implementation of the requirements levied from the FCC and federal government for carriers in our community. So this effort was to best manage that aesthetically or and regulate it so that it's orderly in implementation. The franchise agreements can even be a further augmentation to put into design standards with carriers. So that's what it's all about. It's not about us authorizing 5G, but it's making trying to manage the 5G that's going to be um, put into communities, including ours. Fair to say? I believe that's fair to say. Um, David Pyle, is that fair to say? That's that's fair to say. I would agree with that. Okay. As uh, counselors, is there any other uh, questions regarding the motion on the floor? Oh, Council Member Odell. Thank you. I'd like to uh, make a motion that we defer action on this. Uh, to a date in the future. Point of order. We've already got a motion on the floor. Okay, we have um, okay. we have a motion on the floor. Did you were you making an amendment to the motion on the floor? I will not make an amendment to the motion on the floor. I will vote against it. Okay. All right. So, um, is there any other questions for uh, regarding the motion? Okay, hearing none. All those in, uh, first of all, uh, Deputy Mayor, would you please repeat the motion for the record? Uh, yep, gotta scroll back up, hold on. Um, so I move to close the public hearing and to adopt chapter 21A.56 of the Sammamish Municipal Code as recommended by the Planning Commission with the addition of Exhibit 7, which is the WCF Habitat Code Changes. Okay, and um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay, we have got, and I believe that was, did we have one or two nays? Uh, if you were a nay, can you please raise your hand? 
Okay, so it was a six one. Thank you. A mayor. Madam uh, Mayor, I have a secondary motion there. Okay. Um hold on for just a second. So um David Pyle. This this may be what the deputy mayor is speaking to. Um it's a motion to adopt a resolution yep. of fee schedule. Yep. I yep. think that's where she's I believe <laughs> that's where she's going next. <laughs> That's where, I, right where I'm going. Okay, so I'm, I'm moving to adopt amending the city's master fee schedule to incorporate the wireless facility permit fees. Second. second. Okay, we have a first and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. Okay. We have got a 6-1. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Council. Have a good evening. You thank too. you. Been there many times, Mr. Odell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so it is 9.30. We are going to take a health and safety break of uh, for five minutes, so being back here at a 9.30, well, 9.35, let's see, let's make sure I got the, yep, so being back here at 9.35. Okay, let's see if council's back. Okay, I'm going to wait for one more and then we are going to go because we are an hour behind. And there he is. Okay. Okay, Council, we are um, an hour behind, so we are going to try to keep that in mind as we are going through the rest of our agenda. Um, the next up is the um, athletic fields and Anjali, there she is. Yeah. Um, I believe that this is yours. That is correct. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council and Mr. City Manager. I'm Anjali Maya, Director of the Parks, Recreation and Facilities Department. Tonight we are bringing back responses to your questions from the February 9th study session on the Inglewood Middle School fields and other athletic field projects. We acknowledge that at the February 16th regular meeting, City Council voted to remove this project from the work plan. However, staff were given direction to respond to council questions to help decide on next steps. A full response to the questions is included in exhibit one of your packets. The presentation will cover a majority of them. I did want to note that we are in early stages of feasibility studies for the Inglewood Middle School and that staff have projected hours of usage, operating costs, etc., based on our knowledge of previous projects like East Lake High School. 
With that, I'll turn it over to Kevin T, Deputy Director for our department, and Chris Jordan, Recreation and Cultural Services Manager, to give the presentation after which we will take questions. All right, uh, thank you, Anjali. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor and City Council. Um, I'm Kevin Teague, Deputy Director of Parks, Recreation and Facilities. And as Anjali mentioned, we're coming back to you with answers from our uh, from questions that you all had from our meeting on February 9th. Um, we want you to know that we've heard your, your uh, questions and concerns with this project, and um, hopefully we can answer your questions so that uh, you can give uh, staff direction on uh, how to move forward here. So um, we will start off with uh, um, a little bit of background and then I will go through a quick description of the Englewood Middle School field project and we'll look at the city district interlocal agreement comparisons. Um, I'll talk about the city athletic facilities and then go over some of the uh, neighboring city field project costs and then uh, discuss next steps. Um, then tonight as we conclude, we will uh, be looking to council for some direct direction. Um, the options that we see are option one, um, from the information provided, uh, council may reintroduce into Inglewood Engel Middle School athletic field improvements to the parks work plan uh, and continue on with option one or option two or uh, uh, pause Inglewood Middle School and complete a feasibility study at Beaver Lake Park or thirdly, something else that we haven't thought of tonight. Um, so going over a little bit of background, there was a uh, question about the public process for the park recreation and open space plan. And this was a 12 month planning process that included a st statistically valid community survey, stakeholders uh, sessions and three public meetings as well as a virtual town hall. Um, through this process, more than 1100 residents touched uh, the project um, to shape the pro plan. The results of the pub public input identified top priorities as well as what was missing. Um, public feedback within the Sammamish community ranked athletic facility improvements in the middle of other priorities when asked about city park improvements. However, major stakeholders and leagues that utilize sports facilities on a regular basis commonly reported that increasing the number and quality of athletic facilities are a high priority with the majority citing synthetic turf as the preferred playing surface. The result of the public process was an adopted pro plan with key recommendations that included sports field enhancements. Along with that were some uh, athletic field recommendations. One, to continue with the multi-use field concept. Two, to convert existing turf uh, fields to synthetic and add lights. And thirdly, to continue partnering with the school district on field developments. There was a question uh, from the deputy mayor about the disparity between the project estimate, estimated costs in the pro plan and the CIP. Um, while both are based on conceptual uh, design information, the pro plan had not been updated uh, and parks uh, updated project costs for the 2021-2022 CIP uh, with the help of consultants to get a more accurate picture. So what I'm showing here, this is the CIP that was presented to council on August 11th, 2020. Here we show Inglewood Middle School option two uh, being funded and council uh, expressed concern about showing this option without without a fully negotiated addendum to the ILA with the Lake Washington School District. Additionally, council expressed interest in master plan development of the athletic fields at Beaver Lake Park. This is the second page of that CIP and the third page. So um, staff followed up with council, uh, responding to council's comments and uh, revised the CIP. What's shown here was um, uh, sent to council in an email 
um, and the highlighted items were the items that were changed. This was sent to council on a, uh, August 17th. Uh, here, Inglewood Middle School was scaled back to the option one cost, and Beaver Lake Park was bumped up to $100,000 for a full feasibility study. This is uh, page two of that CIP. And then um, uh, this is the third page of the CIP, and this shows the $5 million um, that had been uh, part of the Inglewood Middle School uh, project and was uh, put in a separate line item called athletic field projects um, to be used for either Inglewood or Beaver Lake or whatever council directs. So um, now I, I will go through the Inglewood Middle School project options um, quickly uh, for the benefit of uh, Council Member Odell in particular, as most of you have heard this before, but I'll be, I'll be quick. Um, the option one in Inglewood Middle School is one synthetic turf uh, field that would uh, um, accommodate soccer, lacrosse, and football. Um, and it would also include lighting and uh, a six-lane synthetic turf track that would be paid for by the school district. Option two is the two field, uh, the expanded plan. Um, it has two synthetic um, turf fields. It has the uh, track for the school district and lights as well. And a, and a restroom, option one has a restroom as well, I didn't mention that. Uh, and then on this option two, at the uh, multi-purpose field, you have a 200-foot uh, outfield softball field, 300-foot outfield, uh, outfield for baseball. And then um, just going over, each of the softball and baseball fields would have uh, batting cages, bullpens, scoreboards, and dugouts. So looking at the costs, um, option one, uh, the uh, city's preliminary uh, project cost is about $4.3 million. Option two is about $10.7 million. And that includes soft costs and contingency. The Lake Washington School District, um, would their cost would be $2.1 million, regardless of who, if we went with option one or option two. Um, and that is uh, because their primary responsibility is the track. The track. Inglewood Middle School um, usage uh, opportunities. Many of the council's questions centered around field usage. For this portion, I will have uh, Chris Jordan walk you through um, those responses. Chris. Thanks, Kevin, and good evening, council. My name is Chris Jordan, the Recreation and Cultural Service Manager for the city. Thank you for allowing me to present to you this evening. I'll be providing some information on field usage, opportunities, and data in Sammamish. It attaches a chart of example of breakdown of one field that would be synthetic and lights at Inglewood Middle School. The field breakdown is broken into five categories on available hours at a field. We calculate these percentages from belt schedule, after school activities, and school year calendar. The results came out with school in session at 26%, after school activities at 12%, community use during the year at 41%, community use during the summer at 18%, and community use for only drop-ins at 3%. We anticipate 62% of the field will be used by the community for rental or drop-in use. Next slide, please. The information on this slide has changed from Exhibit 2 that was sent earlier in your packet. This slide is showing the true usage we had at all three Eastlake community fields in 2019 and how the fields are used by the district and community in a real scenario. The usage at the Eastlake, the usage at Eastlake Community Fields is broken down in four categories of school and session, after school activities and sports, community use through rentals, and community use for drop-ins when there's no rentals. School and session took 29% of the time, after school activities was 18%, community use through rentals was 36%, and community use through drop-ins was 17%. Overall, total usage for community use and rentals and drop-ins was 53%. Next slide, please. In this slide, we broke down the anticipated hours for option one and option two at, at Inglewood Middle School. The data was pulled from current usage at Eastlake Community Fields and compared to current usage at Inglewood Middle, Ingle, oh, sorry, usage at Eastlake Community Fields and compared to current usage at Inglewood Middle School with natural grass. 
With option one, with upgrades to the football field, this could provide increased field usage per year by 64%. With option two, with upgrades to all three fields, this could provide an increase of field usage per year by 105%. Next slide, please. This next part is the breakdown of anticipated maintenance costs for Inglewood based on two different field options. Field maintenance portion includes synthetic turf maintenance, landscaping, custodial services, and general repairs. Utilities portions include electricity, water, and sewer. For option one, we would anticipate field maintenance and utilities be a total of $43,600. For option two, we anticipate field maintenance and utilities be a total of $65,100. The cost of maintenance and utilities will be split proportionally between the city and district based on field usage, which is the same procedure we do for East Lake Community Fields. Next slide, please. We then wanted to look at revenue produced at ESA Community Fields from 2017 to 2019. The city clicked up an average of $63,000 per field over three years, which includes rental and life fees. The city collects and retains 100% of the rental fees and would anticipate the same process for Inglewood Middle School. Next slide, please. Then we wanted you to show you a comparison chart on the contributions by the city and district. With capital investment, the city would be responsible for field improvements and 50% of restroom improvements. District would be responsible for track improvements, land, parking, infrastructure, and 50% of restroom improvements. With revenue, the city would retain 100% of the rental fees, including life fee. With hours, the city anticipates community field use for rental and drop-ins to be 62%, and the district's anticipated use for school-related activities and school in session would be 38%. Then with maintenance, the cost of field maintenance and utilities will be split proportionally between city and district based on field usage. And finally, periodic maintenance. City will be responsible for turf replacement and district will be responsible for parking lot and track repairs. Next slide, please. Finally, I wanted to give you a detailed layout on the city's estimated project costs and revenue over a 20 year period for option one and option two. Starting with option one, the capital cost for initial installation and turf replacement after 10 years would come to $5.4 million. And looking at operating costs, we've totaled the maintenance and utilities, but only calculated the anticipated city share of 62% towards the total costs. Then our revenues include rental and light fees over a 20 year period. So with option one, we're looking at a total cost of $5.8 million and a revenue of $1.1 million, which would give us a 20-year net cost of $4.9 million for option one. Then with option two, the capital cost for initial installation and turf replacement after the 10 years would come to $13.7 million. Then looking at the operating cost, we've totaled the maintenance and utilities, but only calculated the anticipated city share of 62% of total cost. And then our revenues include the light, light and rental fees over a 20 year period. So with option two, we're looking at a total cost of $14.7 million and a revenue of $2.6 million, which would give us a 20 year net cost of $12 million for option two. Next, next slide, please. Next, I'll give you a brief uh, overview of our interlocal agreements. Next slide. We, we wanted to give you a brief overview of interlocal agreements with, for the athletic field improvements with Issaquah and Lake Washington School Districts. In September of 20, 2004, the city executed LA with Issaquah School District, and in October of 2004, the city executed LA with Lake Washington School District. Uh, Issaquah, sorry, School District. Since 2006 through 2016, per the ILAs, the city fully funded in fully funded design and construction of synthetic, synthetic turf conversions and turf replacement at East Lake Community Fields, Skyline Community Fields over those 10 years. However, that changed in 2017 with Issaquah School District with a revision to the ILA that the district group would be responsible for federal, for field scheduling, maintenance, repairs, and utilities. The city only paid 20% of the capital investment for the turf replacement project in 2017. Finally, after, re after researching and reviewing ILAs for, for, from other jurisdictions, we found that each city typically has an interlocal agreement with local school districts, but varies in responsibility, language, operating, and investment. We haven't found an LA that exactly compares to the one we have. I would like now to pass it back to Kevin and thank you, Council. 
Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, I will now take a look at um, some of the questions related to costs uh, between the city and the district. So one of the questions was, can we share more of the capital expenses to build out these fields? Um, and it, it's most important for the council to understand that uh, the field renovations at Englewood Middle School have been the city's initiative, not the school district's. What the school district currently has is their standard for middle schools, and it suits the needs that they have um, for their school programs. If the district were to contribute to the improvement of the, uh, the fields, they would have to upgrade their other middle school fields throughout the district. Lake Washington School District does not offer football, baseball, or softball for interscholastic sports. Track and field and soccer are the only field sports that they offer. Secondly, uh, was there a public process, there was a question about a public process either by the district or by the city showing that the Sammamish citizens want to invest in the fields at Englewood? And uh, the answer is not specifically, uh, no, would, the answer is no, uh, not, not specifically. Um, the district bond that failed in 2018 did not include the field improvements at Englewood Middle School. Uh, neither the city nor the district have done specific polling on the development of fields at Inglewood. Parks base their pursuit on uh, the needs identified through our athletic field study and the, the park recreation and open space plan public input. Uh, third question there, would the district be open to a longer term agreement? And th they would, um, I discussed this with uh, our representative from the district, they would be open to that but it's important that um, any agreement be tied to the length of the turf cycle. And that is, um, that's the, uh, the most economic or the most um, fiscally responsible approach to take. Um, and then the, the last question on this slide is, is there a lower cost option to provide some improvement that will increase use? And we looked carefully at this question uh, with the goal of extending playability and reducing field maintenance. And while we could do some uh, drainage improvements, these would not significantly improve playability um, to a level that offsets the cost or helps with rainouts. Additionally, maintenance uh, of grass field is much more intensive. Synthetic turf uh, and lights maximize the field's usage and the financial investment. Cost uh, options that will, um, that, there really isn't another low cost option that will significantly increase playability. I'll take a quick overview of the city's athletic facilities. Um, the city has four athletic facilities, one in the north, which is East Sammamish Park. And in the south, uh, there is Pine Lake Park, Klahani, and Beaver Lake Park. I'm gonna talk for a few minutes about Beaver Lake Park. Uh, Parks has a feasibility study planned for Beaver Lake Park this year, 2021, to, to uh, begin that study. Um, and we want to look at two options. Option one is to convert the three uh, infields to synthetic turf, add some new backstops, drainage improvements, irrigation improvements, as well as a few other things. And um, we're estimating that at, at approximately $2 million. The second option is the master plan build out, uh, and that um, uh, would be to reconfigure the baseball fields, relocating the baseball fields to accommodate a new soccer field, reducing, uh, to do this, we would need to reduce the baseball fields to the size of little league standards. Um, and, uh, but this would allow us to add a new multi, use synthetic soccer, synthetic turf soccer field that has lighting. <clears throat> there are some unknowns with this, um, and one in particular is the cost of utility connections, as well as critical areas if those have changed since the master plan was initiated. So without the um, utility connection fees, we're estimating this at, at about a $14 million project. <clears throat> one of the major components of the feasibility study will be to get a clear understanding of the costs associated with uh, sewer hookup. Because of the large frontage of the park, uh, sewer connections could cost between $700,000 and 
and 2.95 million, depending on the requirements of the Sammamish Plateau Water and Sewer District. Kevin, I'm going to stop you right there. It is yes. 10 o'clock, and I'm going to need to extend. So I need to extend to 11 p.m. I need a second. Second. Okay, Council, all those in favor of extending to 11 p.m., say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay, who are, who are the nays beside me? Green. Okay, we got three. Ooh, we're going good, you guys. Okay, we got a 4-3, <laughs> and it's 10 o'clock. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay, sorry, Kevin. Continue. Oh, um, so back to Beaver Lake Park. Uh, option one um, adds about 5% of the playable hours. While that may seem modest uh, number of hours, it equates to a significant reduction in maintenance um, as well as uh, the uh, additional hours. Option two would add approximately 25% more hours, which is 590 hours for the master plan build out. Looking at the pros and cons of Inglewood Middle School and Beaver Lake Park, um, Inglewood Middle School obviously is developed land. Um, there are accessible utilities, existing parking lot. The cons are that it is district owned. Um, and um, we're, there's an unknown in terms of the public response to lighting. At Beaver Lake Park, uh, this is a city owned property. It has an adopted master plan. Um, the drawbacks to Beaver Lake Park are the uh, potential utility connection fees, which may be very high, uh, sensitive areas that could impact uh, the layout of the field, and um, the reduction in field size to, uh, to the Little League size will require adult softball to be re relocated to another location. <clears throat> A couple of council members uh, had questions about uh, Beaton Hill Park, and while it is not on the scale of Inglewood Middle School or Beaver Lake, it is a new, newly acquired um, city property, uh, undeveloped land, and centrally located in the city. Um, it has the opportunity for more of an informal field, similar to, to what we have at Pine Lake Park. The constraints are um, its uh, restrictive covenants and tree preservation area, sensitive areas and associated buffers, and then um, varying topography, which will limit uh, options and add cost for grading. Um, the only other location that we hadn't discussed, it's not in our CIP, but it is a pot potential opportunity, is Soaring Eagle Park. And that is a 30-acre parcel that um, was transferred to the city in 2008. Uh, the property can be used for open space, park, or recreation facilities. And uh, it would, to develop this, it would uh, follow the city's master plan process. Um, and uh, as, as I mentioned, it's not in our six year CIP at this point. I'd like to just show you quickly a couple of other similar projects, um, neighboring um, field projects. The first one here is um, Meadowdale Park. And this is a 2017 renovation uh, where they converted three softball, baseball infields to synthetic turf. They also um, converted two uh, multi-use fields. Um, we took a look at this and tried to boil it down to, uh, to be able to compare apples to apples to um, Inglewood Middle School. So we looked at a, a per acre price. Um, and so in today's dollars, this, uh, this Meadowdale project would be about 1.55 million, and in comparison, Inglewood uh, would be 1.56 million per acre. Uh, I will mention too that this project had uh, one of the closer um, similar ILAs. It was developed through an ILA where the, um, the city of Linwood contributed 53% of the cost. The school district uh, uh, paid about 20% of the cost of the project. The city of Edmonds paid 10%, and then they got the rest in grants. And then lastly, I want to show you uh, Brighton Playfield, which is in Seattle. And just real quickly, it, in that same comparison, 
we reduced it down to 2.25 million per acre. And again, Inglewood is about 1.56 million per acre if you uh, really look at apples to apples. So then lastly, I wanna just um, uh, ask for direction from the council. And these are the, the uh, items that I mentioned earlier. One would be to reintroduce Inglewood Middle School to the parks uh, work plan and continue with option one or option two. The second option, which um, is to pause or drop Inglewood um, and complete the feasibility study at Beaver Lake Park. Doing this, um, council can make an informed decision based on more accurate cost estimate and understanding of the proposed improvements at Beaver Lake Park. And the feasibility study uh, will provide better cost use comparison to Inglewood Middle School. And then if there's something else that you all um, uh, have in mind, we could, we could do that instead. Um, parks, we recommend option two, but are open to your suggestions. So um, with that, we are happy to take questions. Okay, first up we have Deputy Mayor. First up we have Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have several questions. There was one slide that I'm hoping can be put back up. Um, it was when Chris was talking and it had the cost, the net cost. This one? Yep, that's the okay. one. So okay. I'm, I'm honing in on this one because option two says um, the total project cost is $14.7 million. And when council was presented option two, February 9th, it was 10.7. What happened? Um, so it's gone up $4 million. I'm, 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 um, okay, so where do you see the 14 million? Uh, oh, I, okay, okay. It says, right, so, Yep. Yes, I can explain that. So, so the, the insta installation cost is $10.7 million. I don't know if you can see my cursor, it's right there at the top. So we're, we're no, looking at, this, okay, this is a total 20-year uh, net cost. So we have installation cost of 10.7 million. We have a 10-year replacement cost of the turf at 2.97. Okay. So that is a, that, then you have a 20 year capital cost of 13.7 million. Oh, I see the 20 year total. That's what I couldn't see because there's uh, um, there's little um, things running across the bottom. When oh. I turn my device the other way, then it, then I can see it says 20 year. Okay, so the okay. net, 20 year, year net is 12 million 67,000. Okay, your numbers are still not the same as they were on February 9th. They're close. The 10.741700 is different from what we had on February 9th. I'm not sure. I mean, it's, yep. it's fairly I minimal, can, but it's still that. not the same. So um, I can I can clarify that, Deputy Mayor. Uh, so the 10.7 is the same, um, and that's the first line of the table here. So there, there's no, we are not projecting any change in the construction costs, the cost to install, which includes construction costs and design costs. I think there was a question at that meeting that we wanted to see beyond what the capital costs, initial capital costs would be. Like what would be oh, the no, cost? I, be? Yeah, no, no, I understand. The installation on the February 9th was 10,733,300. That just doesn't marry up with your 10,741,700. Oh. Those two numbers are different. Because the, There's a tax uh, Yeah, Washington sales tax went up uh, since then. Okay, that would make sense. Um, I have several other questions, but I'm bouncing back and forth now between multiple agendas. Um, hang tight. So I gotta pull it back up because that's where all my notes are. Sorry. There we go. Okay. Um, so one thing I noted when you, I appreciate that staff had attached on here um, the pro plan and then the presentation that council received um, in, I think it was May 2020. So I it did go and look at that. And one thing I noted on that May 2020 presentation that was given to council was a slide um, 
that specifically had recommendations that staff had for adding field lighting. And um, it was Pine Lake Park, Beaver Lake Park, East Mammoth Park, and Klohani Park. And I know we've, you know, kind of eliminated Klohani um, based on community feedback, but Inglewood is not here. So I'm curious as to how Inglewood came to pass as having lighting. Was that a substitution in when Klohani didn't net out for the city or how did we add lights there? If you're referring to a May presentation, was it the was it from the athletic field study? Um, yes, you were giving. I can scroll okay. all the way up on the slide deck to find out exactly what the title of it is. But I believe yes, it's the athletic field study, and it's slide 23 um, in okay. that slide deck that goes through where you are recommending lights. And this is not one of the locations you are recommending lights. So I'm just trying to figure out how yeah. we've added this one and if it was a substitution because Klohani Park is on the list. And then, of course, that was met with staunch resistance from the neighbors um, right. and it was pulled. Right. The athletic field study uh, didn't pay attention to any of our public processes, but that I don't have the presentation up in front of me, but that sounds like just an analysis of city facilities. Inglewood has always been proposed to have lights. It's been in our CIP since, um, I want to say, at least 2006. Uh, sorry, 2015 or 2016. So it's always been um, uh, proposed to have lights. Okay. So then maybe it was just not on this slide that you gave to council last May. And it's, the, the again, it's slide 23, and it says specific recommendations, 2018 pro plan runs through add field lighting at Beaver Lake, Pine Lake, East Spamish, and Klohani Park. So I don't I don't see Eaglewood listed there, which is why I was asking that specific question. Um, I did run through some of the numbers as well um, relative to the different types of sports, uh, what they were asking for, what we're proposing. Um, and I'm curious too on so the field at Inglewood is a combination of lacrosse, football, and soccer. Is that the same thing that you'd be proposing at Beaver Lake? That field would it accommodate all three of those yes. sports? Yes, it would. Okay, that's good. I I still think I'm favorable to pausing this and proceeding forward with completing the feasibility study. At, um, at Beaver Lake Park. Um, and I am curious too to dig in a little bit more um, relative to um, Beaton Hill Park because one of the reasons that we spent a little over $6 million on that parcel, um, I distinctly remember having conversations about fields there. Um, and so I, you know, it, it would be helpful maybe to, you know, get council, I guess, up to speed because what you're saying this evening is that its informal field would fit there. And um, I'm not sure what an informal field looks like. I know you said similar to Pine Lake. Is that the baseball field that's there? Or what's the informal field at Pine Lake that you were referencing? Yeah, we just, uh, you know, look back at some of our notes uh, through the Beaton Hill acquisition, and that was just quote, quoted verbatim from there. But I, the informal field is more related to the scale and the setting of this park. So, you know, you are in a residential setting, and it, you wouldn't get um, a, a complex of fields like you would at Inglewood or at Beaver Lake. And, um, you know, we do have that combination of a section of the park that's to be left uh, with all the dense yep. trees as well as yep. the wetland buffers. Up on the hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, we, uh, you know, if you did end up with a field at this site, the, you know, it'd probably be more fitting rather than just fence off the whole outfield and make it like an athletic field separate from the rest of the park would be, um, you know, better to blend it in where you could use it for different purposes, just like the ball field at Pine Lake. You know, you, you use it for concerts okay. and you okay. use it for athletic play. That helps. I was trying to, when you said informal field at, at Pine Lake, I honestly wasn't sure which one you were talking about. So that, that helps me out. Okay. Um, I am just looking through all my notes here. Oh, so one thing I wanted to note on the hours, and this is, Oh gosh, there's no page numbers on here, so I can't reference it. Um, 
it ha you have the hours for community use for rentals during, during the school year, and I think you guys presented some slightly different numbers, I think is what Chris said during your presentation. Um, but I'm, I'm left to assume that the numbers here are based on if we added the lights, not current state of affairs, because right now during the school year, no one can play on fields between five and nine because a lot of times it's already dark at five. Is that correct? These hours are if we added lights to go to 9 p.m.? Yeah, this is Chris. Yeah, so with the Inglewood, it's it's a little earlier than East Lake, so we can get on the baseball fields probably at 4.30. In the other field, you could get on like at 5, earlier than 5.30. So those percentages are 5.30, like, to 9, and then you get it all um, all weekends during the On the weekends, from 9 to yeah. 9 is what you have there. And okay, the, I just wanted to... And the one ahead. thing, I did bring up the presentation from... Um, I just did a quick thing to bring, for what you were talking about on the May one. It looks like that was from the... Um, it wasn't specific recommendations from us. It looks like those recommendations from the pro plan for 2018. We were just showing... Right. What the recommendation was for those for for the lighting for no uh, yes uh, understood but i think the pro plan is what you know it is obviously engages the entire community and what the community wants so i'm trying to that's why i was trying to ascertain why you know i i know why kalhani is not on there um, but i was just trying to figure out how inglewood you know got um, okay got in there um so based on this spreadsheet, and again, I don't know if these numbers are now accurate based on the new slide that you showed that you said you had some different numbers, but with the lights on, the school would have 38% then of the field use. Are they paying 38% of this bill? No, um, not, for the, not for the field build out. As, um, as I mentioned, this is not their, this is not their initiative. They don't need these fields uh, for their school programs. So this is for the community. Okay, so, okay. I, I don't recall exactly what the district representative um, had stated, but I remember, you know, they're putting in the track because they they want the track. So that's why they're paying for the, for the track and the relocation, I think, of where the, the buses go. But the city of Sammamish is then building fields to which we don't have full use of um, and we are essentially paying for fields in the district that we don't get to use all the time and the Issaquah school district on the flip side has done the work themselves so the taxpayers in the Issaquah school district have already funded the fields that the Esco School District built, they did not ask the city of Sammamish for a contribution to Pine Lake Middle School, for example. Um, they went ahead and, and did that on their own, yet they're still giving the community some use for those fields, is my understanding. So my reluctance in this is that we have, we, you know, we, we have three school districts, but two that we're talking about in terms of, you know, field usage here. And the Lake Washington School District is um, not coming to the table the same way that the Issaquah School District has come to the table. And I think that's a concern for me for balance for our community and our taxpayer dollars. So. Okay, um, next we've got Council Member Stewart. Yeah, uh, can we take a step back for a minute here? Um, are, are we talking about if we do some of these, or are we just talking about when and what order? Because I was under the impression that we need to build out all of these field projects and all of these parks, right? So it's not like we're going to do Beaver Lake and then never do anything else, right? It's that we need to do all of these projects, and we're really just trying to decide which one to do first. Is that an accurate statement? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, but we do not have the funding to build out Beaver Lake according to the master plan and build option two of Inglewood in our um, six-year CIP right now. Right. So it's, it's about it's about what order that we do these in, right. right? So it's not an if, it's a when. And so then the question becomes, which one should we do first, right? Because we can't do them all at the same time. We don't have the money. We don't have the other resources. So then the question becomes, if we, if we pause and we go and do more digging on, and we do more um, studies on Beaver Lake and the Beaten Field, 
How long of a delay are we talking about before we get to this point where we are on the Inglewood Fields? The Beaver Lake feasibility, we could accomplish this year. Beaton Hill is not scheduled. The master plan is not scheduled to start until later in the year. We have to do a consultant selection and go through a public process. So that will take a little more time. But again, that's not going to give you the capacity that Beaver Lake would. Okay. So we'd, be, we'd push it back about a year if we, if we pause and we go do the Beaver Lake feasibility study. So we'd be back here in roughly a year trying to decide which one to do first. Because again, it's not do Beaver Lake or Inglewood, it's which one do we do now and then figure out how to fund the other one over some period of time. So when I look at the hours, like I'm not so focused on the, the 26% um, that would be used in while school is in session because that's almost irrelevant. I'm looking at the total number of hour increase. So doing the Beaver Lake Park in total gives us an extra, uh, what was it, 500 out? No, um, sorry, I, I had the number in my head and now I lost it. The Beaver Lake Park was going to be an extra, how many hours? About 500, I think you're right. Okay, well, that option 500. two. Yeah. Right, so the Inglewood uh, option two, and again, I know there are lots of different options, but just comparing option two to option two, so we've got an increase of 500 hours in total. Um, versus Inglewood, which is almost 1,300 hours. It's like 1,280 hours, right? Mm -hmm. So even if you take the 26% out of that 1,280, you're still talking about 800 plus additional hours, right? 850-ish, if I do the math really fast in my head, 850 additional hours of field usage versus 500 hours of field usage. So when I just look at it from a value to the community, and we're assuming for a moment that improving the fields for the kids that go to Inglewood Middle School during the school day, we're assuming that has zero value, which just to be clear, that's not the case because like 99% of the kids at Inglewood Middle School, if not 100%, are Sammamish residents. But let's assume for a moment that that has no value. We're comparing 500 additional hours to 850 additional hours. And the costs, although we don't know for sure what the Beaver Lake costs are, the costs are looking like they're going to be on the same order of magnitude. Would that be accurate? Yes. Okay. So, so to me, it's really about sort of putting it in a, in a unitized costing thing. So how much is it going to cost us per hour of usage? Um, and again, we'll say outside of, of the school, um, you know, school hour time. So when I look at it that way, and I say we can get Inglewood a year earlier, which is going to save us three to four percent because of inflation, right? Then it seems like Inglewood is still a better value. Just doing it on a per unit basis. It's just like when I go to the grocery store and I look at the toilet paper rolls, and you got to do it on a per unit basis because this one looks way better because it's bigger. But sometimes those other pat right, so you got to you got to unitize it. And on a per hour of, of increased hour field usage, Inglewood is still a better bang for our buck. And we get the bonus of getting it a year earlier and the second bonus that we improve the fields for the kids who go to school there who are all Sammamish residents as well. So that's just how I look at it. I, again, I don't care. Like, I don't have any kids at Inglewood Middle School. I have no... You know, I have no horse in this race in terms of picking Inglewood over Beaver Lake. I'm looking at how do we most efficiently and effectively spend the taxpayer dollars to get the most usage to the community. So, thanks. Council Member Ross. Well, number one. First of all, I, I, it's a very good presentation. Um, I appreciate all the detail and data as well done. It, it helps a lot in this discussion, so I appreciate that. Uh, what I have said previously and I want to reiterate now is I'm concerned about us reaching out first to subsidize the district field and especially at an above standard basis. And so that's problematic to me. I'm also concerned about the ILA 
we need to really avoid those one one dollar sweet deals for the our partners and and try to do what's more fair for the city if we are going to do it at all. Uh, the problem with a ILA it should be proportional if if proportional cost proportional use. I don't even think we're close there. Uh, so that's that's problematic. So it's not a it's not a good ILA. After ten year or your 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 if it's a ten year ILA, that ten point seven million is sunk cost. We don't get that back. We, that stays with the district. Um, all those improvements, and so that's that's got me a concern. Uh, it was mentioned the athletics field study was did not have the public process. And I mentioned, I talked to the city manager earlier about this, but it didn't really come up as an option or a discussion item is we really need to do a athletic fields master plan. Perhaps that's the option three. And when I say that, I want to focus on city owned properties first. Look at Beaver Lake, Beaton Park, uh, maybe some of the other smaller ones, Pine Lake, any of those in our field study and pro plan, look at the city owned properties, try to maximize usage. If there's additional needs beyond that, then we can consider ILAs with our school districts. But as I stand now, I think we really need to take an integrated approach so we balance all of those opportunities and an integrated field study master plan versus the specific field it's going to be easier to work through, given that we've done a lot of work on Beaver Lake, for example. We need to pull in Beaton and and so on. And I I think that's the only way we can make a rational decision, because I'd hate to um, put down $14 million first on Inglewood, which blocks the opportunity of doing Beaver Lake next. We need to maximize Beaver Lake, in my opinion. I think that's our greatest opportunity to have a city jewel. And we don't have to renew an ILA or lose our investment of capital initial. So that's very, very important. Uh, see, anything else I wanted to say? Uh, no, I think most of the, uh, my other co questions or comments are covered by others, but I really think we need to stay, Inglewood or any shared ILA arrangement needs to be the last resort as far as I'm concerned. We need to maximize our that we have and our parks that we have. Okay, thank you. Um, I need some help going back on a slide, so Kevin, maybe you can help me. I want to go back to the slide where it showed which years um, the city did um, interlocals with the different districts. Here we go. Okay, yeah, so I know they did with both the school districts. And um, so it wasn't a matter of they only did with Lake Washington. Um, I know they came back and they did a lot of work with Skyline, did the, uh, the fields at Skyline. And it was my understanding that a lot of, lot of money went into the Skyline and then they, they came back and wanted, after of course the money went in, they wanted, of course, you know, out of the inner local. So it isn't a matter of, you know, um, somebody not stepping up to the plate because I think, you know, um, we've got somebody else who, who may have walked away from the plate. So um, I don't want to start comparing school districts. This is a matter of we have got uh, land out there and we have got kids that need to play ball. And we have got people, we have got kids that need to be serviced. We are a family community. We have more kids per uh, capita than, uh, and population than other cities in the state. And we need all these fields plus a bunch more undoubtedly. So the question to me is where can we put the fields? And, um, you know, I, I'm just, I'm surprised that we are arguing over, yes, 10 years, that was a terrible, terrible interlocal because we don't, the city doesn't make up their money in 10 years, which is why I believe um, our city manager was saying we take it to 20 years because yes, 10 years is a terrible idea. And so there are different things that we can do to make that money back up. Um, but I am still gonna say that uh, to not have something on that north end is wrong. 
and to not service and have not put fields up there when we have land that's available is wrong. Um, we have kids that need to play ball. You know, these kids need sports. These kids need something to do. And honestly, if we are going to say that we're a bedroom community, then we need to do something about it. Um, and with that, I'm going to go to Council Member Odell. Thank you. Um, I'm kind of a latecomer to this whole issue, although I have tried to follow it from uh, the standpoint of uh, being a civilian. Uh, ball fields have been an issue for the council ever since we incorporated, and uh, they'll continue to be that. Uh, I do have a couple of questions, though. First of all, um, has any of our planning taken into account the fact that the Issaquah is about to build a brand new campus on the south end of our plateau? Now, granted, it's not within our, our boundaries, but I'm looking at the plans, and there are at least two ball fields and one big football field, which can also be a lacrosse whatever field. Uh, that will probably alleviate a lot of the hunger up here for fields when that goes in. Yeah, it, it's not in the north end, not in the north end. Uh, uh, it will probably be uh, taken up sooner than I think it is. <clears throat> but I would also, I think that should be part of an overall look at things, and I kind of gravitate towards supporting that. Uh, I am a little concerned about the issue of equity between the way we're treating Issaquah versus the way we're treating Lake Washington. Um, so that is a concern. And I, frankly, when I look at uh, the Inglewood School situation compared to a lot of other middle schools around Lake Washington School District, Inglewood is the one that is, has the highest occupancy rate. So I'm hoping that somewhere along the line we got a signed in blood contract from Lake Washington School District that they will abrogate the agreement and take the field back because they need to expand Inglewood by 50 to 100 percent. And the way they do that is they take the field and build on that and then tear down the old building and make the field back. That's what they've done at, uh, at Market Maine, it's what they've done at Pine Lake, it's what they've done at uh, uh, well, a couple of other places around town. Uh, I don't know what level of conversation we've had with the, with the Lake Washington School District. If it's been at the staff level, that's one thing. If it's been at the board and super level, then I'd feel a little more uh, confident that uh, we won't be hit with a nasty surprise. I am kind of coming around to controlling our own destiny as much as possible. If we can pick up additional capacity, for a reasonable expense, uh, then we can look at some of the other things, but uh, those are my concerns at the moment about this whole thing. And I, I wish I'd had that uh, copy of the run-up of uh, telecasts over 20 years. I did not see it in my packet, and I uh, would appreciate getting a copy of that by email tomorrow morning. Thank you. So we'll get that to you. Council Member Stewart. Yeah, uh, one other thing I wanted to bring up, parking. So um, it, is a, it is a challenge, as we know, uh, at a lot of mm -hmm. our parks. And Beaver Lake uh, Park, while I love that park, it does not have a ton of parking. Um, and so, uh, if you look at the parking situation at Inglewood, there is a lot more parking. And so when you're talking about having a bunch of fields where families and parents are going to come for ball games and things, mm -hmm. um, that is a much improved situation. And we don't have to pay for that. We don't have to pave anything new. We don't have to build the parking. And we don't have to maintain that parking lot. So I just want to throw that out there. And again, I want us to make the decision that is the best value for our taxpayers and gets us the most field hours. I can guarantee you that the kids don't care 
if it's owned by the city or owned by the school district. And at the end of the day, whether it's owned by the city or it's owned by the school district, it's still owned by the taxpayers. So if we look at it from a taxpayer dollar perspective, it's still all goodness for the taxpayers. They still own those assets and they're still getting the benefit of those assets. So if you if we really look at it from purely a, a financial and, you know, Chris, a, a cost accounting perspective, that's how I think we should be making these decisions personally. Um, and, and I will agree with the mayor as well that uh, comparing this to the agreement we had with the Issaquah is, is not the same because this is a 20-year ILA where at the end of 20 years, we've really gotten the value out of our assets. So even at the end of 20 years, if we terminated the ILA at that point, that's when the fields would need to be redone anyway. So I think we'd be in pretty good shape. Um, and I just don't think we should keep delaying. I think we've got to get on building some things um, you know, we know we need more fields, we know we need more infrastructure, and we can talk about it and we can analyze it forever, or we can do it in parallel and we can start building one set of fields while we're doing the more detailed analysis on the next set. And that's, you know, that's something that I know our staff is capable of doing, and I think we just need to let them go and do it so that the community can start to have uh, some benefits. When was the last time we brought any new fields online? It was, uh, I think, 2013 when we built the baseball field at East Lake High School. Okay, and so it's been it's been eight years since we've added any new fields to Sammamish. So it's time. We got to get moving. Thanks. Okay, that's the um, end of what I have in the chat box. Okay, so going to the questions, can you get, take me to the slide with your questions at the end? Oop, that's it, perfect. Okay, so they are looking for a direction. Does somebody from council want to start that? I'm in the oh. queue. Okay. Uh, Deputy Mayor? I move we pause uh, the Inglewood Middle School project and complete the feasibility study at Beaver Lake Park. Second. Any discussion? Well, I'm going to say, I'm going to just say I think that's just not the move that we should make. I think especially since we've just heard it was eight years. I think that's a terrible move, and I don't see where that does anything to help our kids. So I'll be voting against this motion. Okay, any other discussions? Okay. Oh, Council Member Ross. I think you're on mute. Council member? For, oh, there yeah, you are. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm back. Uh, for, for my edification, what did you mean by eight years? Eight years has been the last field that's been brought online. Okay. Okay. So uh, I, I support the motion number two. I, I think it's prudent. Oh, a year's waiting is better if we result in a better decision. We're talking about a 20 year span and I'd hate to make a bad decision at time zero when we can make a better decision after one year and own something in particular. So I'm very much support number two at a minimum. So I'll, I'll go with the, the motion. Okay. Um, we have a first and we have a second uh, for the motion. Um, all those in favor of Deputy Mayor's motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. Do you better do a roll call? Four, three. Yeah, it was 4-3. I believe it was 4-3 as usual. 
you might want to do a roll call on it. I think you should do a roll call on it. Okay. Mayor Moran. Nay. Deputy Mayor Malchow. Aye. Councilmember Gamblin. Aye. Councilmember Odell. Aye. Councilmember Ross. Aye. Councilmember Stewart. Nay. Councilmember Treen. Thanks. Okay, the um, eyes have it, so they will pause the um, Inglewood project and complete the feasibility on the Beaver Lake Park. And yeah. please note that it was a 4 through vote. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Council. Okay, moving on. We are 20 minutes from the end of the meeting. So uh, moving on, the next thing on is uh, the resolution censoring council member um, and, let me see where I've got that, hang on. Gotta bring it up. Okay, and um, I don't think there was any changes to this. This was brought up last week. Do we have, um, this should be exactly what was in your packet, should have been exactly what was brought in last week. Does anybody see any changes to it that they need to address? Well, then I move that we approve the resolution exhibit one, censoring council member Stewart for violation of executive session, sessions privilege. And I'd also like to add on to that uh, five executive sessions that she would be banned from. That's my motion. Second. Okay, we have a motion on the floor and a second. Did uh, Council Member Treen, do you want to speak to that motion? Though I, I think it's clear, do you need to speak? I don't need to speak. Is there any questions? I'm in the okay. queue. In the... I'm in the queue as well. Okay, so we are not gonna have, um, outside of questions two, I'm going to remind everybody that um, there is uh, attorneys involved, so unless it is a question on how this is written or a question to Council Member Treen, I'm going to be very strict on, it has gotta be a question regarding the writing of the resolution, or it needs to be a question directed to Council Member Treen. Other than that, there is to be no questions. Okay, that being said, Council Member Stewart. Uh, well, first, I'd like to answer your question. You said this is what was voted on last week, and that is not the case. Last week, the motion that passed was a motion stating that I violated executive session by disclosing confidential information, and there were no punishments uh, proposed in last week's vote. So this is not the same in any way, just to be clear. Okay. I think that Council Member Treen added that as he stated. No, but the, the resolution does not, does not admonish me for violating executive session by disclosing confidential information, even though that's what all the whereas clauses imply, that's not what is being stated in the resolution. And so just to be clear, I did not violate executive session rules. Okay. Okay, so I'm not going to go down to who didn't, but okay, so I, Lisa, are you on, I'm sure you're on the line. Yes, I am. There she is. Can you speak to uh, the question that she had on the writing of the resolution? Um, I'm not really sure what the question is. I okay. thought I heard her make a statement, but I didn't hear a question. Yeah, she said it does, it does not state that it is for 
uh, what it is for. Is that correct? No, I said it is not stating that I violated executive session by disclosing confidential information, even though that's what the whereas clauses imply. I think the salient point here is that discussion of executive session, irrespective of what is discussed, is in and of itself a violation, and I think that the resolution uh, speaks for itself. Yep. Okay, that's how, that's how I took it. Okay. Okay, uh, next question then is, comes from Deputy Mayor. Yeah, so if I can't ask, so Councilmember Treen added on, and um, I have a, an attorney question. That's not what you said we were allowed to ask. So if I can't ask the ask attorney, attorney a question, question, then we need, okay. Um, can we, the, the motion was to remove Councilmember Stewart from the next, what was it, five executive sessions? Are, do we have that authority to do that? You have the authority to decide who is going to attend executive sessions. Under the guidance provided by MRSC, one example in which um, council members may choose to exclude someone is for a conflict of interest. Certainly that's present here. So I think the, you sorry, go ahead. No, I, I think you do have that authority. Um, I, I think you might use that authority judiciously, and perhaps one way in a, uh, to address that would be to uh, exclude Councilmember Stewart from executive sessions in which um, certain topics are discussed. Um, although there, the guidance from MRSC, I will say, is not very clear on this point. What is clear is that the body can decide who attends executive sessions. So you are free to provide some parameters around that, whether it's uh, part of the sanction, whether it's um, on a case-by-case -case basis, council member Treen proposes five. I don't see anything legally wrong with that, particularly when we don't have a whole lot of um, guidance from um, past, past practices. Okay, so it doesn't have to be subject to which she has a conflict of interest. It could be any executive session, is that? Correct? Lisa, is that correct or not? I, I think that it is, it's a little ambiguous. Um, I think you can, because the overarching principle is that you can decide who attends executive sessions, therefore you would be able to decide who to exclude. The example provided by MRSC is when a council member has a conflict of interest. I did not interpret that example as a limitation on any other rationale. Okay. I'm sorry I can't be a little more clear there, but I think I need to be honest with you that we don't have a real clear roadmap uh, other than it's your choice, it's your decision who attends and who does not attend. Deputy Mayor, did you have any other questions? No, not questions, but. Uh, we can go into executive session if you would feel better going into executive session to have a longer discussion. I feel like I could have a better conversation <laughs> if we could do that. Okay, so um, can you please read me the number for that executive session, Lisa? Sorry, Mayor, was I muted? I think I was yes. muted. The correct citation is, sorry about that, the correct citation is RCW 4230-110-1I. Excellent. Um, and uh, then uh, Council Member Stewart, um, this obviously would be a conflict of interest for you. So I'm going to okay. ask that uh, you not be in this. But we will be um, returning, what, in 10 minutes? Well, let's say, yeah, let's say 10 minutes because we'll have to come back to um, at least, 
you know, decide whether we're going to carry on in the meeting. Okay, 10 minutes. Mayor, I'm sorry. Hello. Excuse me. Hello. Can you, I, I got kicked out, like my session just terminated, so I don't know what's happening. Can you please restate what you guys are about to do? Okay. We are going to go into executive session. But I'm going to ask that you stay here and wait for us. Um, so we'll be back, but it's only going to be 10 minutes because we have to come back and decide whether or not uh, we want to continue the meeting. And under what, uh, what was the uh, RCW? I, Lisa wrote it. It was, Lisa read it. It ended with 42.30.110.1i. I. I. There you go. 1i. So is that the one, uh, Lisa, that uh, gives me that you're going to discuss uh, an action of, an, of a fellow elected and so I can elect to have that discussion in open session where I can participate and defend myself? No. So what is one, 110 1I? Potential litigation. Okay. Okay, we will be back at uh, 11. Could you not be discussing this under? We need to extend care. Yep. Okay, executive we session, we'll be back at 10. Wait, no, no, no. Uh, Council Member Adele's trying to extend I us. Didn't, I didn't hear anything. Karen, we need to move to extend to 11.30. Second. Okay, all those in favor of extending to 11.30 say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, so it is um, a 5-2. Okay, um, so 11.30 um, and Given that we just did that and we've lost five minutes, um, let's take 15 minutes. It is 10.50. We'll be back at 11.05. Okay, Council, we are back. And I am going to turn this back over to you. Let's see, where were we when we left off? Okay, we're going to go back to the, we had a motion on the floor. Mm -hmm. And we had a second. And we were, uh, Council Member Treen, can you repeat your motion? Uh, to approve the resolution exhibit one censoring council member Stewart for violation of executive session and to exclude her from executive session for the next five executive sessions. Okay, and who was our second? I was the second and I'm in the queue to speak, please. Okay, and then um, council member Gamblin. So I just wanted to clarify one point that it, I, I think is integral that we're talking about this. Um, Councilmember Stewart has indicated several times that she believes that she's being censored for disclosing confidential information. Um, th this is not the situation. Um, she's being, the Council Rules to Procedure Section 2.6 prohibits the disclosure of information from executive sessions and states the following. Council members must keep confidential all written materials and verbal information provided to them during the executive session to ensure that the city's position is not compromised. So this is a very specific and important um, delineation. It's not that you can't disclose confidential information. You cannot disclose any written materials or verbal information provided to them during executive session. If we don't have that agreement between us, then what happens is each council member will decide on their own what is confidential and what is not. The rule states you must keep confidential all information from an executive session. 
Okay. Um, I am not as not seeing anything else here in. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. We have a second. I don't see anything else here in the chat. So I'm going. What? Oh, it got. It did. Okay, and if you were in there before, then I was just told that it got cleared. So, um, all right. So, not seeing anything in there. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, uh, Councilmember Stewart, I'm going to advise that um, because of the fact that we have attorney questions here, I'm going to advise that we not, there not be questions going back and forth unless you're going to read as Councilmember Gamblin did. Um, you're going to read from um, a case. So Councilmember Stewart. Sure, uh, I could cite the Miller v. City of Tacoma, which explicitly states that taking a straw vote in executive session is not legal. And okay, that is a full I'm going to stop you with that because um, our, our attorney is going to tell you, Lisa. Well, I'm not going to advise Council Member Stewart as to anything because she's retained her own counsel. Okay. So what I would advise you to go forward with is to, to vote on the motion. Okay. So well, I would just like to say that implying that discussions not accepted under the Open Public Meetings Act cannot be discussed is a false pretense and not a legitimate basis for censure. Okay, thank you. And okay, we've got a motion. We have a second. All those in favor of the motion on the floor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay, so we have got a 6-1. Okay, so um, next we have got um, moving forward, which are new business and it's 25 after 11. We have got the confirmation of the project funding request submittal, and I believe that this is going to be, Jeff, is this you? Yes. It is 20. It is. Okay. Uh, uh, Mayor, I can do a short version or a regular version. What would be your pleasure? Abbreviated is best. Okay. Uh, uh, so then, uh, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council Members, and City Manager, uh, tonight we have with us um, Audrey Starcy. She's our new Deputy Public Works Director. Uh, she's only been here less than three weeks, so please be kind to her this evening. She's the one that has helped me put together these materials in very, very short order. And if we have any questions, she can assist with that. Um, I have provided the council with a draft of this uh, PowerPoint um, earlier. Uh, we made a few picture changes and a one little word change, but what it boils down to is the uh, our, our Congressman, uh, Kim Schreier, their office has put out a, a notice that there's an opportunity for a, a new community project funding initiative. And there are key criteria that projects can qualify for. And of those projects, um, she can only submit, or their district, each district can only submit up to 10 projects uh, per nation, as I understand it. And so the focus staff is recommending um, are three projects that focus on addressing imminent threats to public safety, health, and the environment. Those three projects include uh, 212th Avenue Southeast. Am I sharing my screen? No. Oh, sorry, let me go back. This guy, what am I doing? Okay, here we go. Trying to be quick. Let me know when that comes up, here we go. Is that up? Not yet. Okay, there, no. there you go. Go I apologize, given the hour. Um, so going back to the really quick, um, the, the cover of the presentation, uh, the key objectives of the, of the initiative are shown here. And our focus is, like I said, on public health, safety, and the environment. There's three projects that we are, are recommending to go forward, although the council can choose one, two, or three. Um, that, that'll be up to the council at the end. We're only looking for feasibility money or design money for each of the projects listed. The three projects include 212th Avenue Southeast to help stabilize the segment of roadway that is flooded. 
um, a year or so back. Uh, the next project is Lewis Thompson Road, tight line project. Um, we've had prior discussions with the council about this project going back a ways. And then Issaquah Fall City Road Phase 2A, this is just the flooded section uh, that occurred in the, in the 2019-20 uh, storm events. So the, oops, here we go. Uh, just a little briefing on, on what each of the projects is, is. We have some rough cost estimates that we put together. We've also identified um, some potential grant matches to the uh, appropriation here. We plan to come back to the council um, at a later date uh, pursuing King County Flood Control District uh, flood reduction grants as well. So we hope to match some of this money with a, another local grant for this project and these others that are shown here. Uh, the next project is Lewis Thompson Tightline. Again, we're looking for the design in this case um, from the congressional district, approximately $600,000. And we think um, it would also qualify very well uh, under the King County Flood Control District funding coming up here later in the year. And then the third project, as we mentioned, uh, we've had um, you know, a huge amount of flooding that occurred in the 2019-20 storm. Uh, we were looking to start the design and ask for approximately $400,000 uh, from this appropriation. So the, the, the unfortunate part about this appropriation request is it came out on March 19th. Um, originally, the date was to deliver this on March 26th, and they extended it to April 7th, which is tomorrow. And so I can only apologize that um, we're going as fast as we can, given the council calendaring to bring this before the council and um, seek consideration to authorize the city manager to have staff submit on one or more of these projects. So with that, Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. Great, that was excellent and good work. And Audrey, welcome. Okay, so um, good presentation. And I think every one of those projects is needed. And so um, I'm looking for, um, I think, let's see, we are looking for a motion to direct the city manager to instruct staff to submit the applications for the three projects uh, by the deadline, which is tomorrow. So moved. Second. Okay, do we have any discussion? <laughs> Oh, I'm seeing a couple come into the chat box. Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, I think Councilmember Treen, I believe you were first. Steph and Audrey, uh, thank you very much. Um, and go forth. Let's do it. All three. Thanks. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Ross. So if we submit all three, and they win one or more, we can select what we, which one we want to do, correct? In other words, what I'm getting at is I'm thinking of this kind of like shopping at Macy's when uh, my wife comes home and says she saved $500, but she had to spend $5,000 to save $500. So there's no total cost in these projects. So I'm wondering, some of these are very nominal contributions. Are they nominal contributions to a very large total costs that the city must fund, which may put it on a lower priority if we were to pick and choose. So how do we manage those grants to best utilize them if there is a total cost consideration that may be factored in? And we'll be able to do that later is what I'm getting at. Yeah, it's my, my understanding we'd be able to do that later. Okay, my, my understanding with this particular grant is that the, they have recommended um, not going above a, a million dollars um, for ask for projects, so that has some limitations as well. Okay, thank you, Audrey. Okay, Council Member Stewart. Yeah, uh, is there an advantage to us submitting like just one or just two so that there's more of a focus? <clears throat> or is it more of a shotgun approach? like? We'll throw them in and see which one sticks. You know, at this point, we have taken the shotgun approach because there are, there are different parts of the of the community that's involved in opportunity for feedback mm -hmm. and benefit. Um, they're distinctly different. Um, and so we're not completely sure which one fits best. And as they go through the ranking and review process, um, 
because we didn't get a rubrics as to you know point scores you know in this regard sometimes on your transportation grants you get to kind of know where you're going to score here we don't have that scoring and since we're also looking for the beginning dollars uh, there's an opportunity when i say beginning dollars your your um, uh, feasibility study money or design money is, is, is low-hanging fruit that could fit in nicely someplace if there's because other people may be going after big dollars so hopefully, hopefully that answers your question and then uh, next question is, are, are all of the, uh, again, the feasibility studies, uh, are all of those planned for uh, the near term? Because while we may get to decide later, uh, it's my understanding that if you get a grant, you need to spend it. Because if you don't, uh, the likelihood that that same person is ever going to sponsor you for something, again, is, is much lower. So we shouldn't. We should make sure that anything that we might get a grant for, we actually intend to go do that work and spend that money. From a design perspective, it's easy to spend that because the, the time windows are, you know, six months to 18 months, depending upon the level of detail. Uh, the challenge becomes when the project goes from a million dollar design to a $10 million project and finding the next $10 million. Um, okay. And that'll be the challenge on all our capital projects going forward. Okay. All right, thank you. We need to move to extend again. Okay, We're at 1130, yes, so I was just, move to extend yes, to the night. I've got that. Okay, so did you make the motion to extend? But let's let's yes. finish the vote on this because we have a motion on the floor quickly. Um, unless there's okay. any more questions, and I don't see any. So let's finish this up for him. Since there's no more questions, all those in favor of the motion on the floor say aye. 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 Opposed? Excellent. Thank you, Mayor and Council. We appreciate your support. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Next up, it is um, time to extend the meeting. Okay. Move to extend to midnight. Second. All those in favor of extending the meeting to midnight, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. 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 Okay, so how many nays do we have? Oh, man. Three to four. All right. Okay, we're going to continue on. Okay, so the next is the best starts for kids a levy renewal increase. And that would be... Actually, I have a motion to... Can I make a motion on this one that we table this to a later date? It's not really terribly relevant at this point. Okay. Uh, do you want to make a date certain? Um, only if council wants to take a position on support of the levy, which would make it like October-ish. So if we don't want to take a position on the levy, I um, think we can circle back on it. <clears throat> Okay, does uh, anybody else want to weigh in on this? Councilmember Rodriguez. I'll second that one to table. Uh, to table, okay. Uh, so we have a first and a second to table. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Okay. All right. That brings us to uh, council reports. Deputy Mayor. Oh, mine's there for you to read. Okay. Council Member Stewart. Uh, I just want to, not that anyone's still listening at this late hour, but uh, the draft uh, countywide planning policies were published today. Um, so um, I will share that information and see if we can't get that on the city website for public comment. So um, I encourage the public to go out and review the countywide planning policies and provide feedback. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, then we have another um, executive session. And listen and correct me if I have this wrong, pursuant to RCW 42.30.110.R1F. Is that correct, Deputy Mayor? Yep, and you've got one G as well. 
and uh, also RRCW 42.30.1101G. All right, um, and how, well, how long would be 20 minutes? Is there expected action afterwards? I think that's unknown at this point. Okay. Madam Mayor, do we have a link for that? Pardon? Do we have a link for that? Um, Second session? Do you have a link? Yes, we do. We need okay. a separate one. Yeah, well, can you use the last link that you just had? No. No? Nope. Okay, Mike said you could just use the last link that you just had. Okay. okay. So I assume I just wait here? Yes, because I don't, I can't tell you if there's going to be any, I don't know if there's going to be anything out of this or not. I wish I did because I wish I could tell you whether you get to go to bed or not. Okay, um, 20 minutes. Okay, Council, I'm looking for a motion. Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 See you next week. Oh, there's Pam. All right. Bye.